Thank you. The Committee on the Judiciary Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to call recesses at any time uh, necessary. I welcome everyone to today's hearing on oversight of the Voting Rights Act, potential legislative reforms. Before we continue, I'd like to remind all the members that we have established an email address that we have previously shared and we've previously reminded you about the distribution list to circulate exhibits or other written material the members may desire to offer as part of our hearing today. I also ask unanimous consent that our Judiciary Committee colleagues, Representatives Madeline Dean and Mary Gay Scanlon be permitted to join the panel in the limited capacity where they will be allowed to ask questions if yielded time by a member of the subcommittee. Without objection, thank you. Finally, I would ask all members and witnesses to mute your microphones so when you're not speaking, this will help prevent feedback and other technical issues. And you, of course, may unmute yourself anytime you seek recognition. I'll now recognize myself for an opening statement. Throughout his heroic life, our former colleague and friend, the late great John Lewis, often said the right to vote is the most powerful nonviolent tool we have in a democracy. If we are ever to actualize the true meaning of equality, effective means such as the Voting Rights Act are still a necessary requirement of that democracy. Last month, we marked the one year anniversary of his death. Let us not allow another anniversary to go by without ensuring the enactment of the legislation that bears his name, the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act, to see that we carry forth with what his life's goal was, which was voting. He, was, he gave blood, uh, and when he started the Selma to Montgomery March, almost killed, risked his life. Others did lose their lives in fighting for the right to vote. Just south of here in, in Mississippi, I'm in Memphis, Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman were killed in Philadelphia, Mississippi, simply trying to register people to vote. This problem, which has existed since my childhood, when I was in Memphis, where there were segregated drinking fountains and days to go to the zoo and days to go to public events and where all public facilities had color only sections. And let me tell you, I, I noticed those were not the good seats. They were the worst seats in the football, the basketball, the theater, you name it. Uh, vestiges of those days still haunt us. And that's why this is such an important bill because they percolate up so many times in voting. This subcommittee has devoted considerable time and resources in taking up John Lewis's call to defend that right to vote. All of us in Congress must rededicate ourselves to protecting this most fundamental right at a time when it's once again under severe threat. The record we have built over the course of 13 hearings in the last two years is crystal clear. Voting discrimination against citizens based on race, color, or language minority status is a current and worsening problem that Congress must address through a renewed and strengthened Voting Rights Act. The tidal wave of voter suppression that the nation currently faces comes as no surprise. It is entirely predictable result of the Supreme Court's 2013 decision known as Shelby County, as in Alabama, versus Holder, which effectively gutted the Voting Rights Act's most important enforcement mechanism, Section 5, the preclearance provision. It struck that formula that determined which jurisdictions would be subject to the preclearance requirement. Most of those jurisdictions were in the Old South, where discrimination led us to a civil war, led us to Jim Crow, and still haunt us. Under Section 5, states with a history of voting discrimination were required to obtain approval from the Justice Department for any changes to voting rules prior to their taking effect, therefore giving probable cause or a prima facie case when certain actions in the past had shown there was reason to be suspect, and the Justice Department could show the need to protect citizens. In striking down that coverage formula, the court held that in order to justify states unequally, those that had been listed in the Voting Rights Act and those that hadn't, Congress must create a formula based on current needs. The court invited Congress to develop a new coverage formula, which is part of our mission today. In the absence of preclearance, states and localities have been implementing measures to further deny or bridge citizens' right to vote on account of race, color, or language minority status. And all after one of the most free and fair and impartial and elections in our country's history, the most looked at and reviewed. 
Just since the 2020 election, several states have proposed or enacted restrictive voting laws in the name, as they call it, of election integrity protection. At a time when we just had the most circumscribed election ever analyzed and unanimously said to be free and fair and accurate. Not surprisingly, those states include some of those that have previously been subject to the VRA's preclearance requirement because of their history of voting discrimination. According to the Brennan Center for Justice, as of July 14 of this year, 18 states have enacted 30 laws that restrict the right to vote, including measures that target mail-in and absentee voting. And let me just remind everybody that five states in our country have mail-in voting for every voter in their, all their elections. And it started back in Oregon over two decades ago. But they've targeted mail-in voting and absentee voting and increasing the risk of faulty voter purges and impose stricter voter ID requirements. We're not gonna go into some of the laws that discuss giving powers to state legislative groups to overrule election commissions because that's just an overall abridgment of, of voting rights and not necessarily based on race or uh, speech or color. That's simply uh, politics. At a minimum, these measures disproportionately impact racial and language minority citizens in ways that could result in those citizens being denied the right to vote. Just last month, the Texas legislature began a special session to pass a new omnibus voting measure that would restrict voting access by creating new ID requirements for voting by mail and clamp down on new voting rules instituted by Harris County, the home of Houston, Texas, the state's most populous county and its most populous city and one of its most diverse regions. That, those laws in Harris County were designed to increase voter access. The Texas Senate passed its version of its bill just four days ago. In the absence of preclearance, plaintiffs have been forced to rely on litigation under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which applies nationwide and prohibits voting rules that results in the denial or abridgment of the right to vote based on race, color, or language minority status to confront these challenges. Yet the Supreme Court in its recent decision, just July 1, a little over a month ago, in Brnovich versus the Democratic National Committee, significantly curtailed the ability of plaintiffs to succeed in claims alleging vote denial under Section 2 and burdening yet another of the act's important enforcement tools. In the face of this sustained onslaught against voting rights by the states and localities and the erosion of the Voting Rights Act by the Supreme Court, Congress must act and we have the power to do so. Our authority to stop race discrimination voting remains expansive, even in the terms of the Shelby County decision and the Brnovich decisions. The 14th and 15th amendments to the Constitution, two of the three Civil War amendments, give Congress explicit legislative power to enforce voting rights and equal protection against pur purposeful race discrimination. So by acting, we are doing what the Constitution in its most farsighted fashion after the Civil War said we needed to do to make us a more perfect union. Those amendments form the basis of Congress's authority to pass the Voting Rights Act in the first place. When the Voting Rights Act was first challenged just a year after its enactment, after Everett Dirksen and Republicans had the higher percentage of people voting for voting rights than Democrats, the Supreme Court in South Carolina versus Katzenbach upheld the preclearance provision and its coverage formula holding that congressional authority to enforce the 15th amendment was broad and comprehensive and that implementing legislation needed only to be plainly adapted to a legitimate end. This rationality test is highly deferential to Congress and notably Shelby County did not disturb this essential hold. I also note that the elections clause which converts ultimate authority on Congress to regulate the time, place or manner of congressional elections further bolsters Congress's constitutional authority to protect voting rights in federal elections, our elections. Congress's broad power under this clause does not implicate the federalism concerns expressed by the court in Shelby County. It is important that any new voting rights legislation include a new geographic coverage formula that responds to the court's concerns in Shelby County. We're charged to do that. It should also include a legislative response to the Brnovich decision and other measures such as a practice-based coverage formula reforms to the available scope of enforcement actions under the Voting Rights Act, greater notice and transparency requirements, 
and expanded authority for bail-in preclearance and the use of federal election observers. I thank Attorney General for Civil Rights, Kristen Clark, and all of our witnesses on the second panel for being here today and eagerly await their testimony. Ms. Clark will be our first panel. But now I recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Louisiana, my friend, Mr. Johnson, for his opening statement. Mr. Johnson, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I begin, I think all of us on the Judiciary Committee and every member of Congress must first address the outrageous foreign policy and national security disaster that's taken place over the weekend. The American people awoke this morning to yet another incomprehensible and utterly avoidable disaster created by the obviously incompetent Biden administration. The president is clearly in far over his head. After 20 years, trillions of dollars and thousands of American lives were spent standing up Afghanistan's army and government. The country's been ceded back to the Taliban in less than a week to a disastrously ex executed Biden drawdown. Afghans who've helped the United States over the years are being killed, along with their families. People are hanging on to the side of B-52s as they evacuate for fear of their lives under Taliban rule. There should be top to bottom accountability at the Pentagon and within the administration for this disaster. That this stunning failure has been met with silence from President Biden calls into serious question his ability to carry out his duties as commander in chief. While he vacations at Camp David, America's stature in the world has just taken another massive step backwards. It is shameful and it is dangerous. And I hope every one of us will acknowledge that publicly. The American people deserve and demand better. This morning, we engage, even as all that's going on in what is now our sixth hearing, this subcommittee has held on voting rights since April. So let's go through these motions once again. Today, we'll have more discussion on legislative reforms to the VRA. At the subcommittee's prior hearings, our witnesses have already discussed ad nauseum many of the proposed reforms. As recently as two weeks ago, we discussed the overly broad and constitutionally sub suspect practice-based coverage provision that would require every state and political subdivision to pre-clear certain election practices. In June, the subcommittee held a hearing on other proposed changes to the VRA, such as provisions that would create a new extraordinary legal standard for courts to grant injunctive relief in VRA-related actions and impose burdensome reporting requirements on states and localities. And today, our Democrat colleagues would like to continue the conversation about how the the federal government and partisan bureaucrats here in D.C. should exert control over state election laws. In 1965, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act to overcome state resistance and barriers that prevented minorities from exercising their right, the, the right that's guaranteed to vote by the 15th Amendment. And as we've discussed at all the prior hearings in 2013, the Supreme Court held in Shelby County v. Holder that continuing to require states to pre-clear election law changes based upon conduct from decades ago was an unconstitutional invasion of state sovereignty. Specifically, the court noted that, quote, the conditions that originally justified these measures no longer characterize voting in the covered jurisdictions, unquote. And we should applaud the court's decision in Shelby County because it acknowledges and recognizes we have come a long, long way from one of the most shameful chapters in this country's history. However, instead of recognizing that progress this country's made, our Democrat colleagues seek to propagate legislation that would amount to an unconstitutional federal power grab over local election laws. For example, H.R. 4, as passed last Congress, would create a new Section 4B coverage formula. That new formula would allow a court to retain jurisdiction over a state or a political subdivision for 10 years if a certain amount of voting rights violations have occurred any time in the previous 25 years. Under that new coverage formula, a state or political subdivision can rack up voting rights violations without a finding of intentional uh, discrimination at all. Instead, settlement agreements and consent decrees, in addition to court orders and objections by the attorney general will suffice to trigger federal coverage. This new triggering mechanism is troubling considering the politicization and partisan polarization of the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division. As one of our witnesses today, Hans von Spakovsky has noted, the department has quote, a history of filing unwarranted objections under Section 5 based on its bias in favor of liberal advocacy groups. H.R. 4's new coverage formula will incentivize advocacy groups to file a plethora of objections, creating meritless litigation to trigger coverage. One of our prior Republican witnesses noted the formula, quote, creates something akin to the heckler's veto for the loudest private interest groups, unquote. 
but liberal advocacy groups and Democrats want federal bureaucrats to have control over election administration. Now it appears states will not even be able to readopt voting procedures that were in place before the pandemic without input from the Justice Department. On July 28th, the DOJ issued new guidance regarding state efforts to remove temporary emergency voting procedures implemented last year during the unprecedented pandemic. The Biden administration's new guidance bizarrely suggests that states may not return to voting laws and procedures that existed before the pandemic, saying those laws and procedures may not, quote, be presumptively lawful, unquote. In 2020, state and local governments were tasked with safely administering elections during a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic. It was a once-in-a-lifetime event. Many states adopted temporary voting procedures to reduce public health risks, despite prominent health officials saying that in-person voting was safe. With this new guidance, the department takes the position that these temporary emergency measures, some of which were passed without their state's legislators' approval in a blatantly unconstitutional violation of Article II, are the new baseline from which to judge compliance with the VRA. This is contrary to Congress's intention in passing the legislation and a clear example of the left weaponizing the DOJ to do its bidding. I implore the department and my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to remember, it is easier for eligible Americans to vote than ever before in America's history. I look forward to the hearing and these witnesses today will rehash the same territory once again. Thank you and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I now like to recognize the chairman of the full committee, the gentleman from New York State who has a long history of championing voting rights, having chaired this subcommittee before he uh, became the full chairman, Mr. Nadler of New York City. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you for convening this important hearing at a critical moment in the life of our nation, when our democracy itself is under greater threat than it has been in decades because of a sustained assault on the right to vote in states and localities across the country. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 is rightly regarded by many as among the most sacred texts of our nation's civic religion. It was in many ways among Congress's crowning achievements, but the act was really the result of the sacrifices made by many Americans including our late beloved colleague, John Lewis, who shed their blood or even died to guarantee all citizens the right to vote. The institutions of government, including this one in which we have the honor of serving, are more truly representative of our country because of the vigorous enforcement of the Voting Rights Act. Over the course of this year and during the last Congress, this subcommittee has held a series of hearings documenting in exhaustive detail the myriad ways that the right to vote the most fundamental right in a democracy remains under threat for too many Americans. We, we have also examined the consequences of the Supreme Court's 2013 Shelby County versus Holder decision, as well as last month's decision in Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee, both of which dealt serious blows to the enforcement of the Voting Rights Act. I appreciate this opportunity to consider our, to continue our consideration of how we can restore the VRA to its full vitality and protect its most precious right. Prior to Shelby County, the Voting Rights Act had been an un unqualified success. It helped to reduce discriminatory barriers to voting and it expanded electoral opportunities for people of color to federal, state, and local offices, thereby opening the political process to every American. Despite decades of evidence of the act's success, however, the Supreme Court in Shelby County substituted its own judgment for that of Congress in rejecting Congress's conclusion that a substantial record of continued discrimination in voting supported the act's reauthorization. This decision effectively gutted the Voting Rights Act's most important enforcement mechanism, its Section 5 preclearance provision. Specifically, it struck down the formula for determining which states and localities should be subject to preclearance, effectively rendering the preclearance provision inoperative as there is no longer a basis for subjecting jurisdictions to its requirements. Before the Voting Rights Act, states and localities implemented a host of voter suppression laws, secure in the knowledge that it could take many years before the Justice Department could successfully challenge them in court, if at all. As soon as one law was overturned, another would be enacted, setting up a discriminatory game of whack-a-mole. Section five broke this legal logjam by requiring states and localities with a history of discrimination against racial and ethnic minority voters to submit changes to their voting laws to the Justice Department for approval or to seek a declaratory judgment in court prior to taking effect. In the absence of preclearance, 
Predictably, the game of whack-a-mole has turned with a vengeance. Within 24 hours of the Shelby County decision, both Texas Attorney General and North Carolina's General Assembly announced that they would reinstitute draconian voter ID laws. Both of these states' laws were later held in federal courts to be intentionally racially discriminatory. But during the years between their enactment and the court's final decision, many elections were conducted while the laws remained in place. Since the Shelby County decision, and indeed just since the 2020 election, we have seen a dramatic rise in the number of voter suppression measures being proposed or enacted. Unnecessarily strict voter ID laws, significant scale backs to early voting periods, sharp restrictions on absentee ballots, and laws that make it harder to restore the voting rights of formerly incarcerated individuals are just a small sample of recent voting changes that have a dis disproportionate impact on minority voters. According to a July 22nd, 2021 Brennan Center for Justice report, as of July 14th, 18 states have enacted 30 laws that restrict the right to vote since the beginning of the year. As of August 9th, the nonpartisan organization Voting Rights Lab is tracking 473 anti-voter bills in the states. Of the states that have already enacted new restrictive voting laws, one particularly egregious example that stands out is Congress is Georgia's SB202. This law imposes numerous new burdens on voting, including onerous identification requirements for absentee voting, restrictions on early voting, and most notoriously, it even imposes criminal penalties for offering food or water to voters waiting in line to vote. An effort, <coughs> an effort to pass a similarly sweeping and egregious bill is currently underway in Texas. While some Texas state legislators, through their ingenuity and courage, have managed to temporarily halt it, that effort, the ultimate responsibility lies with us in Congress to fix the Voting Rights Act to ensure that such bills never become law. In the absence of preclearance, victims of voting discrimination have been forced to turn to litigation under Section 2, which applies nationwide, and which prohibits a voting process or requirement that results in the denial or abridgment of the right to vote. Yet the Supreme Court in the Burnabish decision has now seriously eroded Section 2 as well, at least as it applies to vote denial claims. And what can only be described as a usurpation of Congress's constitutionally assigned legislative role, the court in Burnabish announced several new guideposts, seemingly from whole cloth, that lower courts are to consider in evaluating vote denial claims under Section 2's results test. When evaluating these claims under these new factors, lower courts could narrow plaintiff's ability to challenge discriminatory yet facially neutral voting practices, the very practices that Congress broadened the scope of Section 2 to confront. In her dissent to the Brnovich opinion, Justice Kagan properly raised the alarm. She wrote, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 is an extraordinary law. Rarely has a statute required so much sacrifice to ensure its passage. Never has a statute done more to advance the nation's highest ideals and few laws are more vital in the current moment. Yet in the last decade, this court has treated no statute worse. I could not agree more. Congress must act where the court has failed voters across the country. Legislation to revitalize the Voting Rights, Rights Act must include a new dynamic coverage formula that is broad enough to accurately capture the extent of ongoing voter discrimination and the current need for preclearance while being tailored enough to address the court's stated federalism concerns as expressed in Shelby County. Such legislation must also restore a broad understanding of Section 2 as applied to vote denial claims and consider other reforms to the Act, such as provisions to expand judicial authority to bail in jurisdictions into preclearance, provide greater notice and transparency, enhance the ability to assign federal election observers, and facilitate plaintiffs' ability to obtain preclearance injunctions. I thank Chairman Cohen for holding this important hearing to help us examine these critical issues. I look forward to hearing from our esteemed witnesses, including Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, Kristen Clark, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Nadler. It's now my pleasure to recognize a fellow member of the distinguished and august class of 2006, the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Jordan from Ohio. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The United States of America is the greatest country in the history of the world. There's no question that our country has done more to advance the cause of liberty and democracy than any other nation ever. As our Constitution says in its preamble, we're always striving for a more perfect union. Yes, our country has not always been perfect, and we must acknowledge and learn from our failures. The Democrats would have you believe that we are facing some sort of crisis that requires radically changing how we run our nation's elections, but the facts just don't support their arguments, as I hope we will hear today. This is the subcommittee six hearing on H.R. 4, a bill that the Democrats have yet to reintroduce in this Congress. And even though this bill hasn't been introduced, the majority leader announced that the House may vote on it as early as next week. So this is likely the last time the committee will have a chance to talk about the legislation, and we don't even know what's actually in the bill. In 1965, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act to overcome state resistance and barriers that prevented some minorities from exercising their right to vote guaranteed by the 15th Amendment. As originally passed by Congress, the VRA included extraordinary departure from the principles of federalism to combat the, quote, exceptional conditions during a dark time in our nation's history. Despite what some Democrats say, the United States has come a long way since then. In 2013, in Shelby County versus Holder, the Supreme Court struck down the VRA's coverage formula as was outdated. The exceptional conditions from 1965 no longer existed to justify subjecting states to pre-clearance approval from the federal government, as the ranking member of the subcommittee said earlier. The court's decision in Shelby acknowledged the progress that this nation has made since the 1960s, and thankfully, America today is not the same as America was in the 1960s. We should all applaud this progress. Despite the strides our great country has taken, Democrats like to claim that the Supreme Court has gutted the VRA. And they say that why that's why it's urgent to pass H.R. 4. But the facts just don't back that up. What the Democrats fail to acknowledge is that the court's decision in Shelby County did not strike down all of the VRA, not even close. Section 2 and Section 3C remain effective tools to root out intentional discrimination where it might exist. H.R. 4 isn't legislation designed to fix Shelby County. It's legislation designed to radically change how we run elections and to politicize enforcement of the Voting Rights Act. There's no need to amend the VRA and devise certain provisions such as the Section 4B coverage formula that unconstitutionally and unjustifiably encroach on state sovereignty. Also, in another brazen attempt to grab power from state control and give it to partisan bureaucrats in Washington, H.R. 4 seeks to institute a practice-based preclearance provision. This provision would not just apply to states with histories of illegal discrimination, it would apply to every state and political subdivision in the entire country. In other words, every local or city, uh, every local county or city would have to get approval from unelected people in the Justice Department before changing its election process. That's some scary stuff. This provision is also designed to target popular voting integrity measures like voter ID laws, which polling shows most Americans strongly support. Americans deserve free, fair, and accurate elections. Every legal vote should count, something these voter integrity measures would help to ensure. But to justify the unconstitutional federal overreach of the HR4, Democrats argue that states have enacted allegedly suppressive voting laws. The Democrats ignore one glaring fact, however. It is easier today for eligible Americans to vote than ever before in our nation's history. And it's interesting that Democrats always target Republican-led states like Georgia and Texas, for allegedly suppressing the vote when these states actually have more expansive election procedures than Democrat-run states. Georgia, for example, has 17 days for early voting. President Biden's home state of Delaware only has 10. Georgia has no excuse absentee voting. Delaware requires an excuse for absentee voting. But you don't hear Democrats complaining about Delaware. And you don't see the Biden administration uh, bringing suit against Delaware in federal court. The Biden administration's Justice Department has unfortunately politicized enforcement of the Voting Rights Act. And to see how, look no further than the guidance issued by Attorney General Garland last month. In 2020, many states adopted temporary voting procedures to reduce public health risks during a once-in-a-lifetime pandemic. Recognizing the temporary nature of these voting procedures, in 2020, Attorney General William Barr directed the Civil Rights Division to adopt a VRA enforcement policy that would, quote, presume it lawful for a state to revert to election laws or procedures it had before the pandemic. On February 3rd, 2021, the Biden administration abruptly rescinded Attorney General Barr's guidance, and on July 28th, Attorney General Garland issued new guidance. The new guidance said that the state election laws and procedures that existed prior to the pandemic may not be presumptively lawful. So if a state had a lawful election procedure prior to the pandemic, 
then change it to something else and now wants to change it back, the Biden DOJ said it can't do that. With this new guidance, this department takes the position that the temporary emergency measures implemented during the pandemic are the new baseline from which to judge compliance with the Voting Rights Act, contrary to Congress's intention in passing the legislation. Congressman Johnson and I sent a letter to Attorney General Garland last Thursday, strongly urging him to rescind this guidance. We hope we will get a full response from the Attorney General before the House votes on H.R. 4. Even more dangerous, H.R. 4 expands the role of the Justice Department in election administration. As Attorney General Garland's actions have shown, the Biden administration intends to politicize enforcement of the Voting Rights Act. We cannot trust them with these new authorities. Our Constitution, the backbone of our country, is clear that states, states have the primary authority to administer elections, even federal elections. H.R. 4, along with the Biden's DOJ's politicized enforcement of the Voting Rights Act, is a radical effort to federalize elections. It's not supported by the law. It's not supported by the facts. It's a power grab, pure and simple. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. We now welcome our witnesses on both of the panels and thank them for participating in today's hearing. I will introduce each of the witnesses, and after each introduction, we'll recognize that witness for his or her oral testimony. At the conclusion of the first panel, we'll have questions of General Clark, and after the conclusion of the second panel, we'll have questions of all of the panelists. Each of your written statements will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, I ask you to summarize your statement in five minutes, your testimony. To help stay within that time, there is a timer in the Zoom view that should be visible on your screen. When you get to four minutes, you need to be starting to wrap up. When you get to five minutes, you should be finished. Uh, before proceeding with your testimony, I'd like to remind all of the witnesses that you have a legal obligation to provide truthful testimony and answers to this subcommittee, and that any false statement you may make today may subject you to prosecution under Section 1001 of Title 18 of the United States Code. The sole witness on our first panel today is the Honorable Kristen Clark. Ms. Clark is the Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice. In that role, she leads the department's efforts to enforce a broad array of federal civil rights laws, including the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Assistant Attorney General Clark is a longtime civil rights lawyer, having begun her career as a trial lawyer in the Civil Rights Division through the Department of Justice's Honors Program. In 2006, she joined the venerable NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, where she helped lead the organization's work in voting rights and election law. In 2015, she was named the president and executive director of the esteemed Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under Civil Law. Assistant Attorney General Clark received her JD from Columbia Law School and her BA from Harvard. Assistant Attorney General Clark, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Cohen, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties. My name is Kristen Clark, and I serve as Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Division of the U.S. Department of Justice. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the Department's work to implement and enforce the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the need to revitalize and restore the Act. The Voting Rights Act is, as President Johnson said, one of the most monumental laws in the entire history of American freedom. It is a law that has helped to truly transform American democracy. However, the progress that we have made is fragile as we watch the current resurgence in attacks on voting rights. We have seen cuts to early voting periods, new and burdensome restrictions to register or vote, racially gerrymandered redistricting plans, polling sites eliminated or consolidated in communities of color, eligible voters purged from the rolls, restrictions on civic groups seeking to help voters participate in the process and more. I am here today to sound an alarm. In 2013, the Supreme Court's decision in Shelby County versus Holder suspended the preclearance process, the Justice Department's single most powerful an effective tool for protecting the right to vote. The department's ability to protect the right to vote has been eroded as a result. For the Justice Department, restoration of the Voting Rights Act is a matter of great urgency. Before Shelby County, the preclearance process enabled the department to swiftly review 
and block the implementation of discriminatory and unconstitutional voting practices in covered jurisdictions. While Section 5 was in place, the Justice Department blocked over 3,000 voting changes, helping to protect the rights of millions of citizens. Evidence of discriminatory purpose, intentional discrimination, was found in over 60% of voting changes blocked by Section 5. In addition to blocking discrimination, the deterrent effect of the preclearance requirement was undeniable. The Shelby County ruling has given a green light to jurisdictions to now adopt voting restrictions. Today, these laws can only be challenged through long, protracted, resource-intensive, case-by-case litigation. The department knows well the burden that comes with the case-by-case -case approach by way of cases that we've brought recently in states like Texas and North Carolina. This gives to jurisdictions what the Supreme Court memorably called, quote, the advantage of time and inertia. Before Shelby County jurisdictions had to meet their burden of proof by demonstrating that these rules were not adopted with a discriminatory purpose or would not worsen the position of minority voters, today, discriminatory laws are allowed to take root immediately, impacting voters and corrupting the electoral process. We are on the cusp of another potentially uh, transformational moment. Redistricting is about to commence. Virtually every jurisdiction that elects its members from districts, from state legislatures to county commissions, school boards and town councils will be required to redraw district boundaries. New 2020 census numbers show the US has become an increasingly diverse nation with population growth attributable to increases in the number of people of color. Absent congressional action, this redistricting cycle will be the first without the full protections of the Voting Rights Act. Without preclearance, the Justice Department will not have access to maps and other redistricting related information for many jurisdictions where there is reason for concern. Even though this kind of information is necessary to assess where voting rights are being restricted and to help inform how the department directs its limited enforcement resources. In 1965, Congress enacted and in 1975, 1982 and 2006, we authorized a statute that provided the strong medicine needed to remedy voting discrimination and enforce our constitution's commitment to ensuring that no citizen's right to vote would be abridged on account of race or color. Congress has broad enforcement powers and must act now to restore the Voting Rights Act to prevent us from backsliding into a nation where millions of citizens, particularly citizens of color, find it difficult to register, cast their ballot and elect candidates of choice. We look forward to working with this Congress to revive this bedrock civil rights law the Justice Department stands ready to support Congress in protecting the voting rights of all eligible Americans. Thank you. And thank you, we appreciate it. We will now start questioning and I will begin as is customary and I'll recognize myself for five minutes. Ms. Clark, why is section five free clearance so crucial to combating discriminatory voting practices and do you see a connection between the Supreme Court's decision in Shelby County v. Holder and the sustained attack on voting rights that we've seen since that decision over the past eight years? Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Cohen. Section five of the Voting Rights Act is truly the heart of the act. This is a bedrock provision uh, that provided a, a unique tool to deal with the problem of voting discrimination. Um, in the course of our Section 5 preclearance uh, uh, process at the Justice Department, we were able to block over 3,000, over 3,000 discriminatory voting changes that would have otherwise have taken root. Um, this prophylactic remedy is without parallel, and Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act is no substitute. Uh, for the important protections that have been provided through the preclearance process. So we have lost something. And Chairman Cohen, since the court's ruling in 2013, we have seen states move swiftly 
to reinstitute discriminatory changes. We saw it on the day that the court issued its ruling in Texas when it moved forward with a discriminatory voter ID law that had been previously blocked by Section 5. We saw it in North Carolina when the state moved forward with an omnibus bill that turned the clock back on voting rights in multiple respects and in a form in which the Fourth Circuit ultimately described as being carried out with almost surgical precision. Uh, so, so we have lost something and uh, this matter before Congress is an urgent one. We need uh, the, the Section 5 preclearance process back uh, in, in full force and effect. Without it, the Justice Department has lost its most important tool for safeguarding voting rights in our country. Thank you, General Clark. The Section 5 stands out. I, I, I would rate it if you had to go on a scale of 1 to 10 of importance. It's a, it's a 9. And Section 2 may be a 2. Uh, but Section 2 was also damaged in the Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee uh, ruling uh, that denied litigation. Uh, it was a vote on denial litigation alleging vote denial claims, and it remains to be seen how that will affect Section 2 in general. The consensus for many of our prior witnesses who we've had in pre prior hearings is that it will make it more difficult to bring such claims. Do you agree with this assessment that Section 2 has been damaged and its ability to bring claims in the future? Uh, thank you, Chairman. The uh, Justice Department is continuing to look closely at the Brnovich ruling. Uh, we observed that the last time that Congress amended Section 2 was in 1982, and uh, it may be helpful for Congress to use this moment to clarify the factors, the factors that uh, litigants uh, should use to establish a Section 2 claim, the factors that courts should rely upon. Uh, Section 2 remains a very important tool that applies nationwide, as you observe, for confronting voting discrimination. And uh, we urge con Congress to think about ways in which to, to clarify how Section 2 should be applied by courts uh, and by litigants. Let me ask you this at that point. The guideposts that were announced by the court of Brnovich, and they did announce some, had no textual basis and, no, and were contrary to the intent of the 82 amendments to Section 2 that you mentioned of the Voting Rights Act which Congress passed to ensure that the act eliminated discriminatory voting practices in all their forms. What approach would you suggest Congress take to clarify the scope of Section 2 now that the Brnovich decision has been issued? Uh, well, uh, Chairman, the uh, Justice Department recognizes that that choice is ultimately one for Congress to make, but uh, we would urge Congress to uh, look closely at uh, the ruling in Brnovich uh, to look at the ways in which factors identify the court may uh, run contrary to the factors that Congress intended courts to uh, consider when evaluating Section 2 claims. We have decades of case law interpreting uh, Section 2. And so this may be one moment where Congress uh, seizes the moment to make clear uh, those factors that it wants courts to look at uh, and to uh, uh, clarify any any confusion or gray area that may result uh, may have resulted from the Brnovich ruling. Thank you, General Clark. Some have said this is a federal takeover of the state's uh, authority to regulate elections. Would the changes Alabama used to say you had to count the number of beans in a in a jar, or you had to repeat the 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 uh, uh, Shakespeare or something like that before you could get a right to vote? Would those have been challenging those of federal takeover, quote unquote, of election laws, or would that simply been preserving voting rights? Um, the, the latter, Chairman, and I will say from the Justice Department's long experience uh, implementing Section 5, that the department has always worked cooperatively with jurisdictions. It reviewed changes swiftly. At the most, it took 60 days to review and come up with a determination uh, there have been states that have made plain their view uh, that participating in the Section 5 preclearance process uh, was one that they were able to carry out with ease. Uh, so we don't deem this a, a federal takeover. We deem this a, a way of complementing Congress's considered judgment that we need the Voting Rights Act to ferret out discrimination and unconstitutional practices that may otherwise in, infect the electoral process in our country. Thank you, Ms. Clark, and my time is over, uh, and I now yield to the ranking member from Louisiana, Mr. Johnson.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Clark, on July 28th, the DOJ issued new guidance regarding states' efforts to remove their temporary emergency voting procedures that they implemented last year during the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic. Did, did you help draft that July 28th guidance? Um, yes, uh, Ranking Member Johnson. I, I participated along with other career colleagues inside the department. So since the department no longer presumes that the state election administration procedures that were in place before the pandemic are lawful, <clears throat> will the DOJ review how states adopted those temporary emergency election procedures during COVID-19 and whether the manner in which those temporary emergency election procedures were adopted was lawful? Um, thank you, Ranking Member Johnson. Um, as the Attorney General has made clear, uh, protecting and safeguarding the right to vote is an important priority uh, for uh, the department. Right now, we are looking across the country at states that are making changes to their voting practices and rules. The, the point that uh, you, the language that you've seized on uh, simply states that if a, if a state or jurisdiction decides to turn the clock back and revert back to an old practice, that we'll want to look at that uh, with fresh eyes and understand what motivated the decision to revert back to a prior rule. Uh, was the decision one infected with discriminatory purpose or intended to make it harder for particular uh, groups to vote? So there's no presumption of validity when jurisdictions decide to turn the clock back. It just seems like a terribly subjective determination on the DOJ's part at a time when everything is super hyper politicized and it opens a Pandora's box, I think, for a lot of problems. Let's talk about it objectively, though. In Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2 of the Constitution, obviously, it says very clearly state legislatures are entrusted with the integrity of our unique election system, and they are given the exclusive authority to direct the manner of appointing presidential electors for the Electoral College. So as the Supreme Court affirmed in, in McPherson v. Blacker, that power is, quote, placed absolutely and wholly with the legislatures, and it can never be taken away nor abdicated, unquote. So every state's legislature, of course, in accordance with that, has long established detailed rules and procedures to determine their electors. But in the months preceding the 2020 presidential election, those rules and procedures were changed in some states, not by the legislatures, but by a variety of other officials, governors, secretaries of state, election officials, judges, private parties. So does the department plan to review that since it is on its face an obviously clear violation of the plain language of Article 2. Um, thank you, uh, Ranking Member. We're committed to ensuring that every eligible American has, has voice in our democracy and, and is able to access the ballot box. And um, the elections clause of the Constitution also gives Congress the power to uh, impact, uh, ensure access to federal elections. So that elections clause power, along with the enforcement powers that this body has by way of the 14th and 15th Amendment, truly give uh, this sub subcommittee and members of the House the, the power to act now to ensure that no official, no jurisdiction undertakes action that could make it harder for people to vote, especially historically marginalized. Let, let me interrupt you just for a second time. Understand what you're talking about going forward, reviewing what happens now. I'm talking about what happened last year. Is the DOJ interested in that at all? The, the fact that it is a blatant, on its face violation of Article 2 of the Constitution? Or are you just going to go and look at what you choose to look at? I mean, that's a serious question. Well, we conduct very localized examinations of, of the, the voting rules in, in many states across the country. And uh, there is no presumption of validity. Uh, we are going to conduct an intense appraisal of the facts on the ground to understand if a particular law or change violates federal law, federal laws that the Justice Department has jurisdiction to enforce. Okay, um, real quick, the data from recent elections and the DOJ enforcement activity following Shelby County suggests that there is no need to amend the VRA. Are you aware that the Census Bureau data concludes that African Americans in Georgia register to vote and vote in elections at a higher rate? than African-Americans in the Democrat-controlled states of Illinois, New York, and California. Uh, I Thank you, uh, Ranking Member. I think those registration rates are an important data point uh, for this subcommittee to study. I think it's also important to look at conditions on the ground. That's what Justice Robert urged uh, Congress to do. And when we look at the current conditions, we see that there are, uh, in many places, 
uh, you know, voters of color, black voters, Latino voters, and others who are subjected to long lines, uh, voters who uh, have difficulty uh, accessing polling sites because polling sites are being shut down in their particular communities. And so um, looking comprehensively at the facts, I think is what can help Congress undertake what the court asks, and that is really truly looking at her current conditions. I'm out of time, but let's also note that Arizona has a higher voter turnout for minority groups than California. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, now to recognize the chairman for five minutes, Mr. Nadler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Attorney General Clark, when the Supreme Court struck down Section 4B of the Voting Rights Act in Shelby County, the court explicitly invited Congress to rewrite a new geographic-based for coverage formula. What constitutional guidance should Congress draw from the Shelby County decision as it considers how to devise a geographic-based coverage formula to meet current needs. Um, thank you, Chair Nadler. I think that the work that this body has been doing since 2019, the various hearings that have been held in Congress, the field hearings, this hearing today are, are all rising to the, uh, the task that the court has asked Congress to undertake, really studying carefully uh, and thoroughly and comprehensively current conditions across the country. And uh, it, it is our view at the Justice Department that um, that careful analysis will, will yield a picture about where problems are starkest and greatest in our country, about the kinds of, of uh, policies and barriers and restrictions that jurisdictions are resorting to most frequently in order to make it harder for voters of color to, to vote. So this work that is underway right now, I think is, is incredibly important uh, in, in, in doing what Justice Roberts asked Congress to do. Thank you. Is the department's experience, is section two litigation an adequate substitute for section five preclearance? Uh, absolutely uh, not, Chair Nadler. Uh, these cases are incredibly time intensive resource intensive. Just by way of example, in North Carolina, the state spent over $10.5 million uh, defending its discriminatory voting law that came under challenge following Shelby. The state of Texas spent over three and a half million dollars. Uh, uh, Section two is no substitute for the important, swift, preemptive uh, review that was provided by way of the Section 5 preclearance process. We have heard testimony from witnesses that an overlooked consequence of the Shelby County decision is that it has impaired DOJ's ability to appoint federal observers and that the department has come to rely on federal monitors who do not have the same authority to require local officials to grant access to the elections process. Do you agree with this assessment and uh, why or why not? Oh, we do. For the Justice Department, the Federal Observer Program has been a critical tool in how we carry out our work of ensuring that all voters have access to the ballot. Um, federal observers were deployed by the Office of Personnel Management. These were uh, independent, uh, fair, neutral, eyes on the ground in places where there may have been reports about voter intimidation or other election day efforts to make it harder for people to access the ballot box. And so part of what we hope will come out of this process is restoration of the department's ability to deploy federal observers to communities where they may be needed. Thank you. And one, one last question. Does the Supreme Court's Shelby County decision tell us anything about what kind of evidence the court will accept that demonstrates current needs if or when it reviews a new coverage formula? Well, again, um, Chair Nadler, I think that this work that has started in 2019 and continues today shows that, that Congress is leaving no, no stone unturned in understanding what the problems are today, in understanding what the current present day conditions are. And as this uh, work continues and as this effort kind of moves through uh, the Senate, I think it will be plain uh, to the courts that Congress has answered the call, uh, answered the call of ensuring that any uh, post Shelby remedy uh, is, a, is a remedy that is responsive to the current conditions in the country. Thank you. And lastly, uh, 
what geographic coverage formula would you recommend to meet the current need and why would it be constitutional? Um, well, Chair Nadler, the Justice Department's view is that this is ultimately a, a, um, a call for Congress to make. And uh, the Justice Department is proud to aid Congress's understanding of current conditions. I understand that there has been both a geographic coverage uh, provision that has been discussed, uh, that there's been a practice-based uh, preclearance uh, proposal that aims to look at the particular kinds of voting restrictions and rules that tend to be resorted to as ways to make it harder for voters of color to access the ballot box. Um, whatever uh, Congress ultimately decides, decides we know, uh, it, you know, that it must be a record that's justified. It must be a remedy that's justified by the record that you're developing. And so the department is, is uh, proud to be here helping Congress kind of understand what that current picture looks like. Thank you, my time has expired, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Nadler. I now recognize the gentleman from Ohio with the nice orange tie, Mr. Jordan. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Ms. Clark, let me get this straight. I'm gonna go to where the ranking member was. If states attempt to revert to the election law prior to COVID, you're going to come after them, but you're not going to look at the actual changes they made to the election law, changes I think were done in an unconstitutional fashion in many states. You're not going to look at that issue. Um, thank you. So, um, Congressman, we're not coming after uh, any jurisdiction, but we are looking closely to understand why are lawmakers uh, instituting new changes to the rules? And if, for example, we learn that a state was motivated by a desire to make it harder for Native American voters to access the ballot, uh, motivated by a, de a desire to make it harder for Black voters to access early voting, motivated by a desire to make it harder for Latino voters to um, access uh, vote by mail, th those may be important facts that rise to the level of a potential violation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act or another federal voting rights. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Prior to the 2020 election, Pennsylvania election law said that the election ends at 8 o'clock on Tuesday. Uh, that's what the legislature passed. That's what had been signed by the governor. That was, in fact, the election law. Democrats in Pennsylvania went to the partisan Supreme Court, state Supreme Court, and sued in the state Supreme Court. And the state Supreme Court said, you know what, election law doesn't end at 8 o'clock Tuesday, even though that's what the law says. Uh, uh, the election doesn't end at 8 o'clock Tuesday, even that's what the law said. They said, no, now the election goes till 5 o'clock Friday. I think it's a total in run around the legislature, which as Mr. Johnson pointed out, we all know the time, place, and manner of election law is determined by state legislatures. So are you going to look at that fact? Are you going to examine, was that done in a constitutional uh, 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 manner consistent with the Constitution? Are you going to look at that, for example? Well, I'm, I'm not familiar with the situation in Pennsylvania, but we are looking across the country to understand why are our lawmakers changing the rules? And, and our sole goal is not partisan, but to make sure that those changes are not motivated. Okay, by so this, this is a specific voting. question. Will you look at changes made to election law prior to the 2020 election? Will you look at that? Or are you only looking at states who are going to revert back to where they were prior to the 2020 election? Um, we're looking across the country at existing laws, at, at new laws, at laws that have been put on the books recently that are now being taken away. And the sole goal, the sole goal is to ensure that all eligible Americans have access to the ballot and that they have access that is free from I share that goal. I think everyone, I think everyone in this committee here, everyone on this, on this, at this hearing shares that goal. But we also have the, uh, the we also are concerned about making sure election law is done in a constitutionally um, proper manner, proper fashion. And it sure looks to me like in Pennsylvania, as an example, it wasn't because when this state legislature passes an election law that says the election ends at eight o'clock Tuesday, but then the state Supreme Court says, forget what they said, we're gonna now extend the election three days. That never went through the legislature and they extended the election three days. Same thing happened, frankly, with mail-in ballots. Election law in Pennsylvania says that, um, that there's supposed to be signature verification for every ballot. But the Secretary of State, again, not going through the legislature said, you know what? We're not gonna have signature verification for the mail-in ballots in Pennsylvania. 
almost 42 point some million of those ballots never had signature verification. I'm going to go, are you going to look at those changes too and say that's not consistent with the Constitution? So, Congressman, I want to assure you that some of these voting changes that um, uh, you may be referencing may not uh, trigger a violation of federal voting rights laws. And the Justice Department does not undertake its work in a, in a partisan manner. Our sole focus, sole focus is ensuring that lawmakers are, are not acting with discriminate, a discriminatory motive or acting in a way that will have a discriminatory effect on protected minority groups. That, that's it. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. I'd like to ask for unanimous consent to submit into the record an op-ed by the Council of Economic Advisors entitled The Importance of Protecting Voting Rights for Voter Turnout and Economic Well-Being, Economic Well-Being. Without objection, thank you. And I'd also like to uh, uh, enter into the record the 2021 report of the House Administration Committee Subcommittee on Elections on Voting in America, Ensuring Free and Fair Access to the Ballot. Without objection, so done. And now recognize, now recognize Mr. Raskin for five minutes. Mr. Raskin, you are muted or you are mute. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate uh, your calling this hearing. Um, Ms. Clark, um, I wanna ask you about the, uh, the potential enhancement of bail-in jurisdiction. Um, in light of the department's prior experience administering the pre-clearance regime, what's your opinion about the necessity of amending Section 3C to permit courts to bail in jurisdictions for violations of the Voting Rights Act in addition to cases where there have been violations of the 14th and 15th Amendments? Uh, thank you for that question, Congressman. So the bail-in and bail-out provisions of the Voting Rights Act are important features of the statute. Um, they allow a way for uh, jurisdictions that may have long and recent histories of voting discrimination to be brought into the preclearance process. Uh, likewise, bailout allows for jurisdictions that have a clean bill of health for 10 years to be removed or exempt from the preclearance process. And we know that there's scores of jurisdictions that avail themselves of the opportunity to bail out when we had the preclearance process in place. Overall, I think the, the bail-in and bail-out features of preclearance make clear that Congress designed a, a very carefully tailored statute that uh, allows for uh, expansion, allows for restriction based on the records of those jurisdictions. I encourage Congress to, to look at those provisions and see if there are ways to perhaps make it even easier uh, for jurisdictions to bail out or alternatively easier to bring jurisdictions in particularly those that engage in uh, present day discrimination when it comes to voting rights. Yes, um, I've heard now from uh, several of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle um, about this claim that the state of Pennsylvania somehow violated the US Constitution in the 2020 election and that other states had done that before. Uh, my understanding was that 62 different federal and state courts rejected categorically this claim that there was some violation of Article II of the Constitution taking place. But as I understand their line of questioning is directed to you, they're basically saying, would you look at somebody's Voting Rights Act claim that, for example, the extension of hours violated the Voting Rights Act? Is there any reason you wouldn't look at that to determine whether there was an invidious intent or an invidious effect under the Voting Rights Act? Um, thank you. Um, it, again, protecting the right to vote is, a, is an important priority for the Justice Department. It's something that Attorney General Garland has made clear repeatedly. And as we look at the picture across the country, our uh, review is a narrow one. It is focused solely on understanding whether jurisdictions are, are changing the rules, adopting new restrictions in ways that harm protected, minor protected minority groups, groups, uh, who, who uh, deserve the right to be uh, able to access the ballot free from discrimination. This is not a partisan exercise. It is a, a very limited review and, and limited jurisdictional role that the Justice Department has. Yeah, and no courts have ever found that there was either a constitutional 
or a statutory problem with the kinds of changes that they're talking about from the 2020 election, much less that there was a violation of the Voting Rights Act. But it's interesting that they, they began by proclaiming their fealty to federalism, but they're attacking voting practices in particular states, as in Pennsylvania. But I want to thank you for your service, and I want to thank you um, for very carefully threading the needle to help us come up with uh, a statute that will stand the test of time and vindicate our overwhelming constitutional interest in making sure everybody gets the right to vote. I yield back to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Raskin. Our next uh, questioner will be Mr. Clintock, McClintock of California. Is he not on? He's not on. We'll go to, is, is Mr. Roy available? Mr. Ms. Fishback, Mr. Owens, Ms. Ross of North Carolina, you're recognized. Technical difficulties. Oh, no, we've got it, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, I was being very good about mute. Um, but thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having this hearing. And thank you, Ms. Clark, for your testimony. It's very important for our deliberations as we bring the next John Lewis Voting Rights Act forward. Um, the rising voter suppression laws across the country have revealed critical gaps in the Voting Rights Act and its ability to protect the right to vote and to allow affected parties to attain, obtain timely relief under, under the claims that they pursue. And we have certainly seen this in my home state of North Carolina. Um, I wanna bring up the Thornburg versus Jingles case, which did come from North Carolina, where the Supreme Court outlined a non-exhaustive list of factors that a court should consider in vote dilution section two cases. Um, in any legislative response, to, Brock, to the Brnovich decision, do you think it's important for Congress to explicitly clarify that Section 2B continues to apply to vote dilution claims and that courts must apply the Jingles decision to those claims? And if so, please tell me why. Um, thank you um, for that question, Congressman. So um, the Justice Department thinks that it would be valuable for Congress to look carefully at the Brnovich ruling and the factors set forth uh, in the opinion to uh, see whether there's a divergence between the factors that this body had intended courts and litigants to consider in Section 2 cases. And um, clarity, I think, can be very helpful for the Justice Department. Uh, and for other litigants that uh, pursue Section 2 cases going forward. Uh, but that said, uh, the Brnovich ruling leaves Section 2 intact, and it remains an important tool that we are using to safeguard uh, voting rights across the country. Thank you very much for that answer. Um, we've also heard testimony this Congress that the lower court's over-reliance on the so-called Purcell principle has made it inordinately difficult for Section 2 plaintiffs to obtain equitable relief in cases involving late-breaking changes to voting procedures. Should Congress consider amending the VRA to address Purcell, and if so, how? Well, um, again, Congressman, uh, Congress bears broad enforcement powers under uh, the Section 2 of the 15th Amendment, Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, the Elections Clause, which gives Congress the power to uh, uh, speak to the time, place, and manner uh, uh, to, by which voters can access the ballot in federal elections. So all, these, all three of these provisions truly give Congress the power to provide clarity about how it intends Section 2 to be used. Uh, so uh, my answer to your question is yes, this is an area that we would encourage Congress to look at and explore further. And as a follow up to that question, do you think it is particularly important for us to look at this principle in light of the upcoming redistricting that we will be doing um, based on the census results? Um, yeah, yes, Congress, uh, Congresswoman. Um, the Supreme Court has urged Congress to look at current conditions. And 
we know over the course of the past decade, uh, over the course of the past few decades, that redistricting is a moment where we see discrimination rear its ugly head. We've seen racially gerrymandered plans. We have seen efforts to pack minority voters into districts in ways that um, uh, harm their ability to access the ballot. We've seen cracking of uh, minority voters across districts. And so there is a track record here. And I think that the upcoming redistricting cycle uh, underscores the urgency of Congress resolving this issue now, of speaking to the Shelby uh, Court ruling now and ensuring that we have the full protections of the act back in place before the upcoming decennial redistricting cycle gets fully underway. Thank you very much. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Ross. I now recognize the gentleman from Georgia, the man that ranks exactly next to me, but just a little bit behind me in seniority, Mr. Hank Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, during previous hearings on the VRA this Congress, we've heard testimony documenting the fact that Section 2 litigation is a lengthy process, often taking two to five years to completion. By the time a Section 2 plaintiff has an enforceable judgment and the challenged voting practice is blocked or rescinded, um, multiple election cycles for federal, state, and local office will have occurred. And the result is that untold numbers of minority voters can be disenfranchised while multiple elections are held under laws that are later, later found to be discriminatory. The courts can't strike down the results of an election later found to have been conducted in violation of the Voting Rights Act. Ms. Clark, would you agree that lengthy but successful Section 2 litigation over the course of multiple election cycles without a final disposition results in grave harm to individual constitutional rights and to the public interest. And if you believe that to be the case, should Congress consider amending the standard for obtaining preliminary injunction relief so as to ensure that grave harm, that that grave harm is prevented? And if so, what changes would you recommend? Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman. Uh, as I've noted earlier, Section 2 indeed is no substitute for the important prophylactic protections that have been provided by Section 5. Um, in South Carolina versus Katzenbach, the Supreme Court talked about shifting the uh, advantage of time and inertia uh, away from jurisdictions, and, um, uh, and, and we need Congress to act now. Um, uh, as you have observed, the, the costs and burdens tied to Section 2 really make it difficult for Section 2 to serve as a, a substitute for Section 5. Section 5 has been a, a checkpoint uh, on democracy. You raised the question of whether we should uh, think about amending the preliminary injunction standard for Section 2. Uh, but I, I, the Justice Department would urge Congress to really uh, keep Section 5 under its microscope and uh, keep the Shelby County ruling front and, and center as it conducts its review and figure out how we can replace uh, Section 5 or put back in a, a remedy that restores some of those important preemptive protections that have been provided by uh, Section 5. Thank you. Um, currently, the Voting Rights Act only permits the Attorney General to institute an action for preventive relief, including injunctive relief, for a limited set of violations or potential violations. Does this hinder the department's ability to, pr to protect minority voters before a discriminatory practice goes into effect? And if so, how should Congress consider expanding the scope of Section 2 to provide the department with the necessary, necessary tools it needs to prevent a discriminatory practice before it disenfranchises voters? Notwithstanding, of course, Section 5, but Section 2. Uh, 
Uh, thank you, Congressman. If I understood your question correctly, you were talking about some of the unique powers that the um, Justice Department holds under the Voting Rights Act and whether that disadvantages uh, others. Um, that may be a better. Well, no, my, my question is with the limited uh, relief, including injunctive relief that the Attorney General has, to prevent voting rights violations under Section 2 from being ongoing while elections are being uh, conducted, do you believe that Congress should ex uh, consider expanding the scope of Section 2 to provide the Department of Justice with the tools necessary to prevent that discriminatory practice or those practices from occurring while elections are being held? Yeah, thank you, Congressman. I think we want the opportunity to look at that question carefully. Um, it is uh, my understanding that the, um, the, the constitutionality of Section 2 is not in question. This is a nationwide provision that in its current form and, and shape has uh, served as, a, as one important tool for safeguarding voting rights. Um, the Bernovich ruling, uh, I think, raises a question about whether Congress might clarify the factors that courts are supposed to consider in determining the validity of a Section 2 claim. But, it, but, it, but Section 5, I think, is the, the true focus of the work that's underway. And so that's the area that the department has been focused on. And um, we look forward to supporting uh, this Congress in undertaking work to figure out a way to replace and, 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 and restore the important protections that have been provided by that unique Section 5 preclearance process. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Ms. Garcia from the great state of Texas in the county of Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for bringing us together for this very, very important hearing. Uh, too bad it's just number six. I wish it was a lucky seven and we could still have one more uh, before we mark up this bill. Uh, and thank you, uh, Madam Assistant uh, Attorney General. Uh, first, I really want to congratulate you on your historic uh, nomination and position as the head of the Civil Rights Division. It makes me proud to know that you are the first woman and of course, particularly as the first woman of color. So much success and it's great to have you with us today. Uh, and thank you for all the work you've done in the past uh, in this area. Uh, time and time again, this committee has shown the American people how it's, why it is so essential to pass both HR 1, uh, the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Investment Act, especially during this critical moment when Republican-led state legislatures, including my very own state of Texas, sadly enough, who have launched all out assaults to restrict voting rights around the country. That is why I'm proud to have joined many of my colleagues uh, in sending a letter that was led by uh, members of my class, uh, and particularly our comadre, uh, Representative Escobar, who sits on this um, the Judiciary Committee. Uh, we sent a letter to the Biden administration and leadership, urging the need to immediately pass, immediately pass HR 1 and HR 4. With time running out, the American people need Congress to act and address the threats these efforts present to our democracy. We must act to protect the vote. We must act to expand the vote. And we must act to make sure that our children have the benefit of the right to vote. With that in mind, um, uh, Madam Attorney General, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, questions particularly to the recent numbers uh, that were re released just last week. Uh, we show that the first time since 1790, the white population has decreased and that the largest and most steady gains were among the Latino population. Our nation is moving closer and closer to becoming a true multiracial, multi-ethnic society without a clear racial majority. Do you think this is the kind of condition, do you think this is the kind of, of, of um, reflection of, of the changing demographics in our states that require us uh, to act and act swiftly on the Voting Rights Act? Um, thank you um, for that question, Congresswoman. So um, what the Justice Department has seen historically is that uh, demographic change 
uh, can prompt uh, discriminatory voting changes. One example uh, of this would be out of Kilmichael, Mississippi, where following the results of a, a new census, uh, the data showed that the numbers of black population, the numbers of black voters in a particular community had grown substantially. Uh, there were a number of um, black voters who uh, opted to run for seats on the council. Uh, and uh, the town voted to cancel, decided to cancel the election once this happened. Um, that decision was a change that impacted voting. The Justice Department uh, during the Bush administration reviewed that decision to cancel the election and decided to block uh, the change uh, because it was very clear that the decision to cancel the election was motivated by a discriminatory intent. And uh, the election ultimately went forward and the town for the first time elected a majority of blacks to the council and to the mayoral seat. Uh, but it's an example of the powerful way in which the section five preclearance operates. It operates in communities, both large and small communities that may not be on the radar, communities that may be responding to demographic change, the kind of demographic change that uh, we see continuing with the results of the recent census data. To me, this underscores the urgency of the moment and the urgent need for Congress to act now as jurisdictions gear up for the next round of decennial redistricting. Um, no doubt this uh, new round of census data may, uh, may uh, you know, prompt the kind of discriminatory uh, changes that we have seen in the past. You said that the Section 5 was the heart of the Voting Rights Act. Do you think we're, we're on a code blue? I mean, it is urgent. We must act. I mean, we're, we must act to ensure that voting rights uh, are, are protected around the country and the territories. Absolutely. It's been eight years since the Shelby ruling. Restoration of the Voting Rights Act is an important priority for uh, the Justice Department, and we look forward to working with you until the very end uh, to help uh, understand what the current conditions are and to help fashion a remedy that's responsive to the problems that we're up against today. Thank you, uh, Madam Assistant Attorney General. Again, congratulations on your uh, selection, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. And now we go to another outstanding member from Houston, Texas where they not only sing, but they dance, <laughs> Sheila Jackson Lee. Mr. Chairman, I'm honored and I'm honored for this very historic and important hearing. And I wish uh, we were in the other body with seven to 10 minutes for each of us. I know Mr. Chairman, that is not the case. Let me welcome uh, the uh, Assistant Attorney General and thank her for her leadership uh, and her expertise. Uh, in the midst, uh, Attorney General, of the fights around critical race theory, uh, the new census that for the first time would not have the protection of the 1965 Voting Rights Act and the increasing diversity in this country um, and people uh, making this a race question, uh, I believe that this is more, more crucial than ever before. And when I say that, opponents making the question of the voting rights about race. It is not about race. It is about voting rights. It is not about black people only or Hispanic only. It is about voting rights. And I'm saddened by my, uh, my dear colleagues who have made this a race question. I rebuke that. And the reason why I do it, I'd ask unanimous consent to put into the record, 1965, 1970, 1975, 1982, 1982 again in 2006, of the record that shows that every vote on the reauthorization and the authorization of Voting Rights Act was bipartisan in huge numbers. Republicans and Democrats, whites and blacks, Hispanics, African Americans, and other diverse persons in the United States Congress. I ask unanimous consent. I in ask spirit, unanimous consent. In the spirit Thank of Jim Sensor Brenner, it will be without objection done. And with unanimous consent, I wish to put into the record uh, warrants served to Texas Democrats, my colleagues, brave colleagues who are fighting against voter suppression and an analysis. It's harder to vote in Texas than any other state. We are 49th. It's harder than 49 other states, as evidenced by research uh, in academic institutions. Ask unanimous consent 
for that as well, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, it shall be entered into the record. Uh, Madam Attorney General, I'll give you two questions uh, that I know that uh, you'll realize my time. Uh, the Shelby County case impaired the ability of the DOJ to employ federal observers, having us having relegated us to using local observers. Would you indicate how important uh, that question of federal observers, but how that impairs you and whether that assessment is correct so that federal observers should be reinstored, number one. Number two, uh, under the um, uh, Brnovich case, uh, tragically undermined uh, section two, uh, we seem to have the ability uh, to put in a bifurcated test under section two, one that would deal with assessing voter dilution like uh, the redistricting and one that would deal with voter denial claims such as voter ID. Would you then uh, answer how important that uh, perspective would be? My last point would be, and I'm down to 1.50 almost, is the importance of prospective federal hearings, uh, field hearings that could ultimately uh, be put into the record as we move forward, uh, both in this body and the other body. Thank you uh, to Attorney General uh, Observers, Section 2, and the hearings. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, so on the on the first point, the Federal Observer Program has been an important tool in the Justice Department's work to ensure that all eligible voters, especially uh, voters of color, are able to access the ballot free from discrimination. Uh, the Justice Department had routinely received reports about voter intimidation efforts or other tactics uh, aimed at making it harder for voters of color to vote. And the deployment of federal observers by way of the Office of Personnel Management allowed the department to put independent eyes and ears on the ground in those communities. Uh, those are people who could uh, document uh, uh, and tabulate what was happening. Uh, those are people whose mere presence uh, often helped to neutralize uh, situations that otherwise may have unfolded on the ground. And so we're very hopeful that this process will help to restore the ability the, the ability of DOJ to deploy observers, federal observers going forward. Section two uh, question, yes. With respect to um, section two, uh, at, at, as Congress well knows, it has broad enforcement authority under the reconstruction amendments, but there is also broad powers vested in this body by way of the elections clause, uh, which give this, gives this body the ability to uh, ensure uh, access in federal elections, to institute legislation concerning uh, the time, place, and manner uh, by which voters are able to access uh, uh, federal elections. And so, uh, you know, we urge Congress to, to lean on and, and use uh, its broad enforcement powers to ensure access to, to, to the ballot box. Field hearings. And field hearings, I think, uh, Congresswoman, are a, another way to further complement the work that you're doing right now, uh, you know, bringing members together to kind of debate what is the appropriate remedy to address the problem is key. But uh, particularly given the pandemic, getting on the ground uh, and giving voters on the ground the opportunity to present to you the story about what they're seeing and what they're experiencing when it comes to voting discrimination could be an important way to further complement the record that you're developing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank, to the Attorney thank General. you. And uh, uh, Ms. Garcia, did you have your hand raised for some reason? Yes, sir. I would like to ask unanimous consent to answer for the record the letter I referenced that was signed by uh, about 15 members uh, to President Biden and leadership uh, to uh, act on the Voting Rights Act and HR1 immediately. Without objection, it will be done. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, we can't hear you. That was it. That was good. You win the prize. It was a test. <laughs> uh, I'm paying attention. I win the prize. Thank you. You do. Ms. General Clark, we want to thank you for your service. Um, to our nation and your testimony today, which is very helpful as we compile a record to propose a bill at some time in the future. And uh, with that, you are dismissed and appreciate it for your work and go back to protecting our country and we'll go on to the second panel. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Very grateful. You're welcome. Now we're at the time for our second panel.
we'll call up our witnesses uh, for the second panel, and we'll give them a few seconds to come up on the uh, virtual panel. And they are all appearing. There they are. I think we're all together. Great. Our first witness on the second panel is Mr. Wade Henderson. Is Mr. Henderson on yet? He is. Great. Mr. Wade Henderson is an institution. He is uh, one of the, 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 like, you know, you're looking for the three wise men, and he's one of them. Uh, he's the interim president and CEO of the Leadership Conference for Civil and Human Rights, having previously led that organization for more than 20 years. The Leadership Conference is a coalition of more than 200 civil and human rights organizations. He's a graduate of Howard University, uh, a little earlier than uh, Vice President uh, uh, Kamala Harris was a graduate, and also of the Rutgers University School of Law. Uh, Mr. Henderson, you're recognized for five minutes. You have to unmute. Mr. Henderson, you need to unmute. Wade, not if you can hear me. You can hear me. Now you need to unmute yourself so I can hear you. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I was, there you go. I was muted by the committee. So I apologize. More than like that's happened to me too. <laughs> but you're recognized now and you're unmuted. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, uh, Ranking Member uh, Johnson, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We deeply appreciate your leadership in highlighting the ongoing crisis of racial and other discrimination in our voting system and the urgency in fulfilling the promise of our democracy. The House Judiciary Committee has taken seriously both its authority and obligation to restore the Voting Rights Act after the devastating decision in Shelby County versus Holder unleashed a torrent of voting discrimination that continues to this day. Today, I offer critical evidence in support of the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. The court in Shelby County held that the formula for imposing preclearance upon states and jurisdictions was, quote, decades old and outdated, unquote. The court instructed the Cong that Congress could update such a formula based on, quote, current conditions, unquote, in voting. Through several state reports commissioned by the Leadership Conference, and prepared by our partner civil rights organizations and allies. We are introducing current conditions of racial discrimination in voting. We offer reports documenting recent voting discrimination in 10 states and plan to introduce additional reports while the record remains open. These reports powerfully demonstrate that Congress has an urgent imperative to restore the Voting Rights Act. They reveal that voting discrimination after Shelby County is pervasive, persistent, and adaptive. We include the voter restrictions passed this year after the historic voter turnout in 2020 elections, but also include other recent history of these states. This is the current discrimination on which Congress must update the preclearance formula and then make several additional amendments to the Voting Rights Act so voters of color everywhere can fully participate in the political process. Here is just a sample of what our reports contain. In North Carolina, before the Shelby County ink was dry, lawmakers introduced a monster anti-voting uh, voter bill that the Fourth Circuit struck down for targeting African-Americans, quote, with almost surgical precision, unquote, not to be outdone. Texas began enforcing its own photo ID law previously blocked by the Justice Department and later found by federal courts to have been motivated by an unconstitutional discriminatory purpose. In South Carolina, lawmakers adopted a strict photo ID law, but then amended it to address its discriminatory impact after an objection was interposed by the Justice Department, leading a court to say, quote, one cannot doubt the vital function that Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act has played here, unquote. In Alabama, lawmakers packed Black voters into majority Black districts, thereby diluting their vote. The Supreme Court remanded the case on the ground that, quote, 
evidence that race motivated the drawing of the particular district lines, unquote. And the, a three-judge court found the legislature was improperly motivated by race. For Alaska, we submit a well-developed record of discrimination against the state's indigenous peoples, which include denying that the 15th Amendment's protections apply to Native voters, providing less information to Native voters because they are Native, and failing to offer language assistance despite court orders requiring it. In Louisiana, just this year, the Justice Department challenged the at-large method of electing aldermen in the city of West Monroe. Although Black residents comprise nearly 30% of the voting age population, no Black candidate has ever been elected. In Mississippi, where the first lawsuit under the original Voting Rights Act was filed, the Fifth Circuit found that Calhoun County's redistricting plan, quote, diluted minority voting strength, unquote, in violation of the Voting Rights Act. Just months ago in Virginia, a federal judge enjoined an at-large system for electing city council members, recognizing that its discriminatory effects reflect a broader culture of racial discrimination in the city and the state that continues to impact voters of color today. And just this year, Florida placed restrictions on the ability of organizations to assist with voter registration a bedrock activity for many groups whose mission is to enhance participation among voters of color. And last but not least, in Georgia, a federal court found that Sumter County's reversion to at-large voting for school board elections was a, quote, severe infringement of Black voters' right to vote, unquote. And in the wake of the historic 2020 election, which produced the state's first Black U.S. Senator, the legislature passed even more discriminatory restrictions, eliciting eight different lawsuits, including one filed by the Department of Justice. Earlier this month, we celebrated the 56th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. Contrary to Chief Justice Roberts' pronouncement in Shelby County, our country has not changed fundamentally. Voting discrimination today continues to constitute a stain on our democracy. We implore Congress to swiftly pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. The future of our democracy hangs in the balance. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. We had a brief technical problem, but we're back. Uh, I need to start my video. We're back. Thank you, Ms. Ross, for being in the on-deck circle. You may be needed again. Our next witness is Mr. James Peyton McCrary. Mr. McCrary is professor uh, professorial lecturer in the law at the George Washington University Law School, previously serving as historian in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice. He received his PhD from Princeton and his uh, undergraduate and master's degrees from Penn. Mr. McCreary, you're recognized for five minutes. Chair Cohen, Vice Chair Ross, Ranking Member Johnson, and distinguished members, thank you for inviting me to testify before you today. Although I retired from 20 years of full-time university teaching and 26 years of government service in the Department of Justice, I still co-teach a course on voting rights law each fall at uh, George Washington University Law School, where adjunct faculty bear the title professorial lecturer in law. My testimony today is offered in my personal capacity as a historian, not as a representative of any organization. My testimony focuses on empirical evidence identifying the jurisdictions that would be covered by a new form of federal preclearance of voting changes, which I understand is being contemplated by this chamber. Representatives of the Brennan Center for Justice and the Leadership Conference Education Fund retain me as a consultant to investigate the geographic provision in uh, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act passed by the House of Representatives in December 2019 as H.R. 4. <clears throat> the VRAA seeks to restore the preclearance provisions of the 1965 Voting Rights Act by revising the coverage formula invalidated by the Supreme Court in Shelby County versus Holder. Preclearance refers to the process of receiving prior federal approval before implementing any change affecting voting. I have identified the jurisdictions that I believe would be subject to preclearance 
should the 2019 version of the John Lewis Act become law using research methods I've employed over the last four decades. The period under review in uh, the VRAA is the last 25 years. The conclusions could change if, my conclusions could change if the Congress alters the review period. Uh, entire states could be covered under the VRA, but uh, even if the entire state is not subject to preclearance, any individual political subdivision could be covered if the record of voting rights violations in that subdivision uh, fits the criteria uh, set out in the John Lewis bill. An entire state would be subject to preclearance if either 15 or more voting rights violations occurred within the state during the previous 25 years, or if 10 or more violations occurred in the state, at, at least one of which was committed by the state itself. In non-covered states, any individual political subdivision would be covered if it had three or more violations <clears throat> uh, during the previous 25 years. Under the current version of HR 4, violations include A, final judgments of a voting rights violation by the federal courts, B, objections to voting changes by the attorney general, and C, a consent decree or other settlement causing a favorable change for minority voting rights such as consent decrees protecting language minority citizens. While I am not testifying as to any approach Congress should take, I note that changes to the formula could lead to different conclusions than those I have reached in my study. As a university professor in the 1980s, I served as an expert witness in numerous voting rights cases in the South. And beginning in 1990, I joined the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice as a social science analyst, retiring in December of 2016. My responsibilities in the Civil Rights Division included the planning, direction, coordination, and performance of historical research and empirical analysis for voting rights litigation, including the identification of appropriate expert witnesses to appear for the government at trial. Since retiring from government service, I have served as an expert in several voting rights cases brought by private plaintiffs. A record of my scholarly publications over the last 43 years is set forth in the curriculum vita attached to my testimony. And my written testimony explains the methodology employed in my investigation. <clears throat> the eight states that, according to my analysis, are most likely to be subject to preclearance of voting changes under the current formula are Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Texas. Exhibit one to my testimony identifies the violations in each of those states. Several of these states could drop out of coverage depending on how Congress revises the bill. <clears throat> those states are Alabama, Florida, North Carolina, and South Carolina. Each is close to the minimum threshold set forth in the bill. So minor changes in what counts as a violation could make a difference. Changes to the definition of violations or shortening the review period could remove some states from preclearance coverage. For example, if the review period were shortened to 20 years, <clears throat> I calculate that only Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Texas would likely remain covered. Several states that appear currently not to be covered uh, <clears throat> could be uh, nevertheless uh, covered uh, if, uh, the, if cha certain changes in the preclearance formula were made. That, those states I address in Exhibit 2 to my testimony. In my calculation, Virginia currently has only eight violations. Changes in the formula could cause Virginia to meet the threshold of 10 violations, however, because two of the eight violations I have identified were enacted by the state. New York and California are each between 10 and 15 violations but none were committed by the state. Under the current- Professor, we're gonna have to, I think my timer says your five minutes is up. And if, I, if it's not, I'm sorry. And if it is, we need to wrap up. Thank you. Uh, the bill you're considering can play a key role in confronting current efforts to limit voter registration and voting by minority citizens, as well as diluting minority voting strength. Based on my 41 years of experience in voting rights litigation, I believe that strengthening enforcement of the Voting Rights Act is a critical need for our democracy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our next witness is Ms. Wendy Weiser. 
Ms. Weiser is Vice President of Democracy at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU Law School. She focuses on voting rights and elections, money and politics and ethics, uh, redistricting representation, government dysfunction, rule of law, fair courts, and all other things that are good and fair and just and sweet and American. She received both her BA and her JD from Yale, Bula Bula. Ms. Weiser, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Cohen, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee. In Shelby County v. Holder, the Supreme Court gutted the most powerful and successful provision of the Voting Rights Act, its preclearance requirement, because it found that the formula Congress used to determine which states should be covered by preclearance was outdated. At the same time, the court invited Congress to craft an updated formula, one grounded in current conditions and needs and targeting jurisdictions where discrimination is sufficiently pervasive and persistent to justify preclearance. And that is precisely what this Congress has done and is now sharpening in the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. I will make three points. First, as many have already noted, our country is emphatically currently facing extensive and persistent race discrimination in voting, the extraordinary conditions that make preclearance both necessary and constitutionally justified. This committee has already collected reams of evidence on this subject, and through my written testimony, I add four new publications to the record. One key finding I'd like to highlight Turnout among non-white and white voters is now substantial. Turnout among non-white voters is now substantially lower than that among white voters, and it has been for at least 25 years. In the 2020 election, despite record overall turnout, roughly 71% of white voters cast ballots, compared to only 58.5% of non-white voters. In the states likely to be covered under the VRAA the racial turnout gap is even starker. And in virtually every one of those states, the white black turnout gap has grown dramatically since Shelby County. In other words, contrary to what the Supreme Court observed in Shelby County, the turnout gap has not in fact closed for black voters, that was anomalous, and for other minorities, it never had. Second, Targeted geographic coverage remains a necessary and appropriate way to root out intractable discrimination in voting. Even though discrimination is now widespread, the evidence before this committee overwhelmingly shows that it is much more prevalent and tenacious in some places than in others. Third, the geographic coverage formula that Congress is contemplating is eminently sensible, fair, and constitutional. It has been modernized and designed with precision to respond to the Supreme Court's concerns in Shelby County. To ensure that it rationally targets illegal discrimination, the formula relies on the best evidence of discrimination, documented violations of laws prohibiting race discrimination in voting. To ensure that it targets states with a pattern of persistent discrimination, the formula captures only those states that meet a high numeric threshold of violations over time. As we've heard, either 10 violations, if at least one of them is statewide, or 15 total violations over the prior 25 years. And to ensure that it targets states where discrimination is current, the formula is not frozen in time, but rather rolls forward so that coverage always turns on modern considerations. And the bill also limits the duration of preclearance coverage to 10 years, so that jurisdictions without recent violations automatically roll out of coverage, and jurisdictions without recent violations can easily bail out before then as well. In short, the formula is effectively designed to identify those places where voting discrimination is recent, widespread, and persistent. And as a factual matter, based on Professor McCrary's research and the record before this committee, the formula succeeds in accomplishing that aim based on the jurisdictions that are covered. And these are precisely the circumstances when preclearance is most needed and most legally justified. So in conclusion, as Justice Kagan observed in her recent dissent in the Brnovich case, this is a perilous moment for the nation's commitment to equal citizenship, an era of voting rights retrenchment. The scale of the current problem of voting discrimination and vote suppression is enormous, 
and it is about to get much bigger as states and localities across the country begin their redistricting. It is a problem that only Congress can solve by passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and the For the People Act. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weiser. Our next witness is Maureen Reardon. Ms. Reardon is a litigation counsel for Public Interest Legal Foundation. She joined that group in 2021 after serving 20 years as an attorney in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice. Uh, during the Trump administration, she became senior counsel of the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. She received her JD from St. Mary's, her BS from Seton Hall. Ms. Reardon, you are recognized and welcome back. Thank you. Um, good afternoon or morning, Mr. Chairman, ranking members and members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you again for your invitation to speak with you. I am an attorney currently with the Public Interest Legal Foundation. It's a nonpartisan charity that's devoted to promoting election integrity and preserving the constitutional mandate that states administer their own elections. As you said, for over 20 years, I served in the Civil Rights Division, 18 of those years as a voting section attorney, as well as senior counsel to the AG for civil rights. From 2000 um, until the Supreme Court's decision in Shelby County versus Holder, uh, my primary responsibility was to review uh, changes that were submitted for Section 5 preclearance. Uh, in my June 20. 2021 testimony, I shared with you firsthand observations of the unethical conduct that occurred on a daily basis within the section. This conduct included instances of twisted racialism, blatant political violations of the Hatch Act, the leaking of protected work product to media sources, targeting of African American colleagues not deemed to have acted black enough, disdain for the equal protection of civil rights laws for all Americans and the impermissible collaboration with many of the advocacy groups scheduled to testify today. But you don't have to take my word for it. You can read the DOJ Inspector General, General's report on this point and the letter from the Justice Department to Representative Sensenbrenner. The fact is that the voting section attorneys have been sanctioned millions of dollars for bad behavior in Section 5 enforcement. And when you finish reading the report from the Inspector General, you will rightfully wonder if it's a good idea to give this office so much power over every election. Section 5 was temporary provision for a reason that no longer exists. And the Supreme Court made clear in Shelby that only certain conditions would ever justify a formula for Section 5 coverage today. Some of the touchstones listed by the court are blatantly discriminatory uh, evasions of federal decrees, a lack of minority office holding, and voting discrimination on a pervasive scale. Federal intrusion into the powers reserved by the Constitution to the states must relate to empirical circumstances if they presently exist. And in Shelby, the court rejected the dissent's notion that the preclearance requirement of Section 5 would be constitutional into the future when there's never any evidence of an unconstitutional action by a state. Yet that's exactly what Congress is attempting to do through HR 4. As proposed, HR 4 would subject jurisdictions to the rigors of Section 5 for violations of the Act, Section 5 violations, Section 2 violations, and consent decrees. It reaches back years ago, 25 years to be exact, um, for findings that would trigger coverage. I would ask all of all of us here on the panel to go back 25 years and ask yourselves if you think that was recent. I do not believe that it is. Section two findings that used the disparate impact theory uh, that were um, that the Supreme Court now says were not justified in the Brunovich case would also trigger preclearance. Uh, the use of Section 5 previous objections to trigger coverage singles out again only those states that were previously subjected to Section 5 preclearance. Um, those that were never subjected to Section 5 have no Section 5 history. And as um, Mr. McCrary testified, those states would be Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, North and South Carolina, and Texas. These were, this is exactly the targeting of certain states that the court in Shelby found to be unconstitutional. Now, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act forbids intentional discrimination and processes that result in a discriminatory electoral outcome. And in its infancy, it was mostly confined to vote dilution. But since 2013, which of course was the year that the Shelby case was decided, 
plaintiffs began filing Section 2 vote denial claims against um, electoral procedures such as voter ID requirements, trying to persuade the court to reduce the standard of evidence required for a Section 2 violation. However, based upon this misuse of Section 2, there was a split in the circuit courts, and that gave the Supreme Court, in the Bronovich case, an opportunity to enunciate a true constitutional standard for courts to evaluate these claims. Although many of my colleagues might not like the result in Bronovich, it was their improper use of Section 2 as a replacement for Section 5 that necessitated the Bronovich decision. If you look at the disparate impact theory, it is almost identical to the retrogression theory enunciated in Section 5. There are permanent provisions of the Voting Rights Act today that provide the tools necessary for the department to root out intentional- Thank you, Ms. Reardon. Your, your time is up. If you want to close, you have five seconds. Sure. These tools target current discrimination and are consistent with allowable federal oversight that was enunciated in Shelby. Thank you. You're welcome. Our next witness is Tom Sines. Mr. Sines is president and general counsel of the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, the uh, acronym MALDEF, position he's held since August of 2009. Uh, he was also for MALDEF, with MALDEF for 12 years and for eight years he taught civil rights litigation as an adjunct professor at the University of Southern California School of Law. He received his BA and his undergraduate degree, both from Yale, both with honors. We are honored to have you. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, ranking member, uh, subcommittee members. Uh, I am president and general counsel of MALDEF, which for 53 years now has worked to promote the civil rights of all Latinos living in the United States. An essential part of pursuing that mission has always been seeking to protect the voting rights of Latinos in this country. As a result, MALDEF has ample experience in enforcing the Voting Rights Act, Section 2, Section 5, and Section 203. We have done well over 100 cases under the Voting Rights Act. I have to say, as often as not, that has been against the critically important state of Texas or one of its subdivisions. Our experience tells us that it is imperative that Congress act to restore the use of preclearance as a vigorous tool in enforcing the voting rights of Latinos in this country. As you will readily understand, given last week's news from the Census Bureau indicating the incredible growth of the Latino community, and in particular, the Latino voting community across the country, where more than half of this country's total population growth in the last decade emanated from the Latino community, you can understand why we anticipate extreme challenges in enforcing voting rights for Latinos throughout the country in years to come. The simple fact is rapid and significant demographic change ongoing in this country means that too many jurisdictions will hit a tipping point, as you, Mr. Chair, have characterized it, when they will perceive the growth in the Latino vote as a threat to those currently in power. Uh, that necessitates a tool that is efficient and effective in preventing those who hit that tipping point from reacting by seeking to restrict the voting rights of ascendant minority voting groups, including in particular, the Latino community. It is essential that we again use preclearance effectively to address this challenge. Now, there are some who have previously expressed the view or the preference that the Supreme Court should strike down the entirety of the preclearance regime. As you know, in Shelby County, it did not do that. It struck down a coverage formula and invited the reintroduction of preclearance through a new and invigorated coverage formula. Today, I urge the Congress to move forward in enacting a two-part coverage formula, one that includes geographic coverage for those jurisdictions, including many in and including the state itself of Texas, which the Latino community, as I mentioned previously, has often had to challenge in its attempts to restrict the right to vote of Latinos and other minority voters. That geographic coverage ensures that those who've been recalcitrant and often crafty in seeking to prevent minorities from exercising their right to vote would be subject to the very effective and efficient pre-clearance process to determine whether those new proposals can comply with the Voting Rights Act. I urge the Congress to include also the complementary practice-based coverage 
on which this subcommittee heard a few weeks ago, this would permit ensuring that new jurisdictions without having had the opportunity to acquire a history of violating voting rights, but that adopt practices that history shows have frequently been used in the past in other jurisdictions precisely to stem the growth of minority voting power would also be subject to preclearance. I have stated previously, MALDEF's extensive experience tells us conclusively that section two, while critically important, is not an adequate substitute by itself for the use of preclearance. Section two litigation is expensive. It is time consuming. It too often cannot put in place a remedy prior to the occurrence of one or more elections, despite challenged voting changes being in place for those elections. Preclearance is critically important as a device of alternative dispute resolution or ADR. Like all good ADR, it ensures that our federal courts are not inundated with too many cases under the Voting Rights Act by putting in place an efficient alternative decision maker in the preclearance process. It's one of the great ironies that political forces that support ADR, mandatory ADR, and other circumstances have failed to embrace it here. But I embrace it and urge Congress to recognize how important ADR in the form of preclearance is to ensuring the challenges presented by rapidly changing demography and a reaction to unprecedented participation in the last election in the form of new attempts to suppress the vote can be answered effectively and efficiently under our constitution. Thank you. Thank you. Our next witness is Mr. Ms. Sophia Lynn Lakin. She's the deputy director of the ACLU Voting Rights Project. Uh, and if my fingers can do me better than this, come on, there we go. And assist in the planning strategy and supervision of the ACLU's voting rights litigation nationwide, including service as the lead counsel in the ACLU's federal lawsuit challenging multiple provisions of Georgia's new law, SB 202. Uh, Ms. Lakin received her JD from Stanford. Uh, she received an MS and, and a BA from Stanford. She is a true Stanford Cardinal. Ms. Lakin, you're recognized. Chair Cohen, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee, Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Sophia Lakin and I am the Deputy Director of the ACLU's Voting Rights Project. The VRA is one of the most successful pieces of civil rights legislation in our history. But eight years ago in Shelby County versus Holder, the Supreme Court gutted the VRA's most powerful provision, the Section 5 preclearance system. My colleagues have testified powerfully about the importance of restoring the system. After Shelby, the principal means to protect against discrimination in voting is section two of the VRA, which authorizes challenges that can be brought only after a law has been passed or a policy implemented. But section two itself has been under attack in recent years in at least three ways. First, the Supreme Court in Shelby based its ruling in part on the assumption that plaintiffs would be able to obtain preliminary relief before an election to guard against elections going forward under regimes that are later struck down as discriminatory. But the theoretical availability of such relief has proven to be inadequate. The current standard for obtaining a preliminary injunction, including a showing of a likelihood of success on the merits, is a particularly high bar to relief in voting cases, given their complexity and fact-intensive nature. These cases also take multiple years to litigate, which means many elections involving hundreds of elected officials can take place under regimes that are later found to be discriminatory, an irrevocable taint on our democracy that we have unfortunately seen play out many times. My prior written testimony describes 15 cases in which voting rights plaintiffs who ultimately succeeded were unable to obtain preliminary relief while their cases were pending, with numerous elections taking place, millions of voters casting ballots, and hundreds of elected officials taking office under regimes courts ultimately find are discriminatory or are abandoned. Second, this problem has only worsened due to the metastasization of the so-called Purcell principle. 
This is the idea that courts should be cautious changing election rules if an election is imminent. But what began as a common sense warning to consider potential voter confusion and administrative burdens now operates as almost a per se bar against intervening as an election draws near. The use of Purcell to block relief has exploded in recent years from six times in 2012 to 11 in 2016 to 58 in 2020. And the doctrine is continued to continuing to expand well beyond the common sense warning in the Supreme Court decision that is the Purcell doctrine's namesake. Purcell is invoked today, even when there is no risk of voter confusion, little to no administrative burden, and where plaintiffs have acted as quickly as they can, or there are unforeseen emergencies, like an unprecedented pandemic. And it has taken over the analysis of whether to order relief, even when there's been a strong finding that the election rule being challenged likely violates the Constitution or the VRA. Worse yet, all too frequently, Purcell is wielded inconsistently in one direction only, to undermine efforts to ensure that discriminatory practices are blocked before they can taint an election. My written testimony for today and earlier this summer highlight numerous examples. Left unchecked, Purcell threatens to kneecap voting rights litigation nationwide. Third, compounding all of these challenges, the Supreme Court's recent decision in Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee has further undermined Section 2 as the robust weapon to combat voting discrimination this body intended it to be. The decision raises the bar for voting rights plaintiffs to show an actionable burden on voters, while at the same time dramatically lowers the bar for government defendants, allowing the mere specter of voter fraud without any evidence to justify discriminatory practices. Fortunately, for all of these issues, Congress has the power to act to protect voting rights. Congress has the clear authority to set standards for the issuance of preliminary relief and injunctions in voting rights cases, and the clear ability to correct the misinterpretation of the VRA contained within Brnovich. Not only does Congress have the power to act, it also has the responsibility. Racial discrimination in voting continues to threaten the health of our democracy. Section two is an important and necessary tool to combat that threat and its continuing vitality is critical. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lakin. Our next witness is Hans von Sp Spakovsky. Mr. Van Spakovsky is a manager of the Election Law Reform Initiative and senior legal fellow at the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. He previously worked at the Justice Department as counsel of the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, providing uh, help with the Voting Rights Act and Help America Vote Act of 2002, and served on President Trump's Presidential Advisory Commission on Election Integrity. He received his law degree from Vanderbilt University School of Law, arguably the finest law school in the South, yet in Memphis, arguably the second best law school in the state of Tennessee, and his undergraduate degree from MIT. Mr. Von Spakowski, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I, I do want to say I'm testifying today in my personal, personal capacity based on my own research and not on behalf of the Heritage Foundation. Look, the answer to the question of whether there is a need for legislative reforms to the Voting Rights Act is a straightforward no. After the Supreme Court's correct decision in Shelby County, the Voting Rights Act, through its various provisions, including Section 2, remains a very powerful statute whose remedies are more than sufficient to protect all Americans. With the latest guidance from the court on the proper application of Section 2 in the Bronovich case, the Justice Department and private parties have the legal means at their disposal to stop those increasingly rare instances of voting discrimination when they occur. The claim that there is a wave of voter suppression going on across the country that requires expansion of the VRA is simply false. Efforts to enhance the integrity of the election process through reforms such as voter ID requirements and improvements and the accuracy of statewide voter registration lists are not voter suppression and frankly protect all voters uh, no matter what their color or ethnic background. This is evidenced by steady increases in registration and turnout in states that have implemented such reforms, as well as the enforcement record of the Justice Department, which has seen a steady decrease in the number of enforcement cases due to a decreasing number of violations of federal law, even after the Shelby County decision. 
During the entire eight years of the Obama administration, the Civil Rights Division filed only four cases to enforce Section 2. The Trump administration filed two Section 2 enforcement cases. Thus, there was no upsurge in Section 2 cases after the Shelby County decision. In fact, the Obama administration filed far fewer Section 2 enforcement cases than the Bush administration. That record does not support the claim that there are widespread, unlawful voter suppression actions being taken against minority voters. The Census Bureau's 2020 election survey also clearly demonstrates that there was no wave of voter suppression keeping Americans from registering or voting or that requires amending the VRA and expanding the power of the Justice Department. Instead, the Census Bureau reports that the turnout in last year's election was 66.8%, just short of the record turnout of 67.7% in the 1992 elections. In fact, the turnout was higher than the turnout in President Barack Obama's first election, which was reported by the Census Bureau at 63.6%. The census survey shows there was higher turnout among all races in 2020 when compared to the 2016 election. Black Americans turned out at 63% compared to only 60% in 2016. 59% of Asian Americans voted in 2020, a 10 percentage point increase from 2016. And the Census Bureau reports that voter registration in 2020 reached 72%, which is higher than the 70% who were registered in 2016 after eight years of the Obama-Biden administration. Not only that, but voter registration in 2020 was higher than the 2000, 2004, 2008, and 2012 elections. The Hispanic share of the vote was just behind that of Black Americans, who had 12% of the total vote in 2020. The same percentage of the total vote by Black Americans in the 2016 election at the end of the Obama-Biden administration. The bottom line of the Census Bureau survey is that Americans are easily registering and they are turning out to vote, vote when they're interested in the candidates who are running for office. In fact, in an election year in which we were dealing with an unprecedented shutdown of the country due to a pandemic, we had, according to the Census Bureau, quote, the highest voter turnout of the 21st century. The proposed amendments are almost certainly unconstitutional because they don't satisfy what the Supreme Court said is required to justify continuing, much less expanding, the preclearance requirement. As the court made clear, any requirement that states obtain federal pre-approval of any proposed election changes could be imposed only if Congress can show blatantly discriminatory evasions of federal court decrees, lack of minority office holding, voting tests and devices, voting discrimination on a pervasive scale, and flagrant or rampant voting discrimination. None of those conditions are anywhere to be found in 2020. With the availability of Section 3, which has not been much discussed here today, a judge, if presented with evidence, can put a uh, particular jurisdiction under pre-clearance coverage and continue it as long as necessary. That makes much more sense than a broad, uncustomized pre-clearance requirement. Thank you. Thank you, sir, and your timing was better than Michael Jordan's. Our next witness is John Greenbaum. Mr. Greenbaum is the Chief Counsel and Senior Deputy Director for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, where he's responsible for managing the committee's work to seek racial justice and previously headed its Voting Rights Project. He's also the co-chair of the Voting Rights Task Force at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. He received his JD from the UCLA School of Law and his undergraduate degree from Cal Berkeley. Mr. Greenbaum, you are recognized for five minutes. Chairman Cohen, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on ways in which Congress can remedy the damage to voting rights caused by the Supreme Court's decisions in Shelby County versus Holder and Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee. For my oral statement, I'm going to focus on two suggested sets of modifications to H.R. 4, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, which the House passed in 2019. The first set is to address the Shelby County decision beyond what's in H.R. 4. Four. I recommend that the United States or, or an agreed party be granted the right to bring an action anywhere nationally if a voting change is retrogressive. In other words, voting changes that worsen the voting opportunities of persons of color. This would be in addition to the geographic and known practices preclearance provisions in the HR4. 
The retrogression cause of action provides an additional reasonable and necessary weapon in the fight against suppressive and discriminatory voting practices. It responds to current needs, which are not limited to those states of political subdivisions that may be subject to geographic coverage or known practices coverage. To accompany the retrogression cause of action, I recommend expanding the existing transparency requirement in HR 4 to require states or political subdivisions to provide a notice of any voting changes. In addition, I would recommend a relatively modest waiting of period of 30 days after jurisdictions give notice before changes may be implemented. The 30 days would run after administrative preclearance were applicable. This would allow plaintiffs to seek preliminary relief to stop retrogression voting changes before they are implemented. I believe that these modifications individually and collectively are constitutional under the current framework set forth in Shelby County, that current needs for a law must outweigh the law's burdens. Regarding the current needs to voters, these modifications would serve. We have seen a proliferation of retrogressive voting changes that are often difficult and time consuming to challenge otherwise. By the way, the Lawyers Committee itself, one organization, was involved in 50 lawsuits in 2020. Conversely, the constitutional burden on jurisdictions is modest. Retrogression is a concept that the Supreme Court has found to be constitutionally acceptable and permitting plaintiffs to prove a case of discriminatory effect is standard under civil rights laws. The notice and waiting provisions create little additional constitutional burden. Because the law would be national in application, the equal sovereignty principle set, by, set forth by the Supreme Court in Shelby County would not come into play. My second recommendation is that Congress address the Brnovich decision and restore vote denial results claim under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act to the pre-Brnovich standard that several courts of appeals had adopted. When Congress amended Section 2 in 1982 to explicitly allow for discriminatory results claims, it did so as part of a legislative scheme to eradicate discrimination in voting. In the 1982 Senate report, Congress stated that Section 2 was intended to capture the complex and subtle practices which may seem part of the everyday rough and tumble of American politics, but are clearly the latest in a direct line of repeated efforts to perpetuate the results of past dis voting discrimination. 1986 in Thornburg versus Jingles, the Supreme Court said that the essence of a Section 2 claim is that a certain law, practice, or structure interacts with social and historical conditions to cause an inequality in the voting opportunities enjoyed by black and white voters. Since Jingles, four different circuit courts addressing vote denial cases used the foundation la laid in Jingles to analyze these, these matters. This formulation distills Section 2 liability into a two-part test. One, there must be a disparate burden on the voting rights of minority voters. And two, that burden must be caused by the challenge voting practice because the practice interacts with the social and historical conditions of racial discrimination. In answering the second question, the courts have used factors identified in the Senate's 1982 committee report. The Supreme Court decision Brnovich provided guidelines for future treatment of Section 2 vote denial results cases that were not only new, but also contrary to the dec decades-long accepted standards. My written testimony sets forth the various ways that the Brnovich decision runs contrary to Congress's intent that the VRA eliminate discrimination voting and how Congress should go about restoring Section 2 claims to the pre brnovich standard. The eight years since the Supreme Court's decision, Shelby County versus Holder, have left voters of color the most vulnerable to voting discrimination they've been in decades. The record since the Shelby County decision demonstrates what voting rights advocates feared that without Section 5 voting discrimination would, would increase substantially. The Brnovich decision, by creating new hurdles for Section 2 claimants, claimants to overcome, raises the stakes appreciably. Congress must act. Thank you for providing the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Greenbaum. And as the TV show, Beat the Clock, you're Bud Collier. Our final witness is Samuel Spittle. Mr. Spittle is Director of Litigation for the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. Prior to joining the Legal Defense Fund, he practiced over a decade at two national firms working with the Legal Defense Fund as co-counsel on numerous cases involving capital punishment and voting rights. He also served as a law clerk for Justice John Paul Stevens, one of the great justices in our nation's history. Mr. Spittle received his law degree and his undergraduate degrees from Harvard. He liked Harvard and Harvard liked him. Mr. Spittle, you're recognized for five minutes. <laughs> 
Thank you very much, Chairman Cohen. Good afternoon uh, to Chairman Cohen, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to testify today. Since its founding in 1940 by Thurgood Marshall, LDF has been a leader in the struggle to secure and protect voting rights for Black Americans and other people of color in this country. Today, our nation is at a critical juncture in that struggle, and we are here in no small part because of the two Supreme Court decisions that a number of other witnesses have talked about already, which have weakened the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 had long been recognized to be the most transformative of the civil rights laws passed in the 1960s. It has aptly been called the crown jewel of the civil rights movement. For over 30 years, as you heard Assistant Attorney General Clark say, the preclearance mechanism was at the heart of that act. And that language is from a Supreme Court opinion describing the Voting Rights Act. What preclearance did was it required jurisdictions with particular histories of voting discrimination to submit proposed changes in their voting laws to either the Department of Justice or a federal court in order to ensure that those changes did not continue to worsen discrimination against voters of color. Preclearance was so essential because it blocked discrimination before elections could be held under discriminatory laws and because it prevent, prevented the continuing evasion, the continuing circumvention of favorable decrees that were achieved through litigation that blocked certain kinds of discrimination, but then a jurisdiction would just turn around and circumvent that decree with some sort of new kind of discrimination. And if you look at the brief that LDF filed in the Supreme Court in the Shelby County case, which we've submitted as an exhibit to my testimony, you'll see example after example where very recently in the years leading up to the Shelby County case, Section 5 continued to prevent jurisdictions from circumventing these successful decrees that were achieved through litigation, showing just how essential Section 5 remains in modern times. In 2013, as we've discussed, a sharply divided Supreme Court decided the Shelby County case, which rendered preclearance inoperative. In response to that decision, in jurisdiction after jurisdiction, formally covered by Section 5, there was an unleashing of new kinds of voter suppression laws. If you look, for example, in Justice Kagan's Brnovich dissent, she identifies state after state, sometimes within days, sometimes within a few years after the Shelby County decision, which went to a new voter suppression law that in many cases had previously been stopped by Section 5. But as devastating as the Shelby County decision has been, the court made clear in that decision that Congress has the authority to create a new preclearance mechanism that is grounded in current conditions. After all, the 14th and 15th Amendments assigned to Congress, not the Supreme Court, the authority to determine in the first instance what measures are necessary to enforce the right to vote free from racial discrimination. LDF has testified on multiple occasions to our experiences monitoring elections and litigating some of these voter suppression measures. While LDF and other civil rights organizations have successfully responded to some of these new discriminatory measures with litigation, litigation is not sufficient to address the persistent and adaptive nature of discrimination against Black voters at both the state and local level. It is therefore essential that Congress restore Section 5 consistent with the court's guidance in Shelby County. H.R. 4, as passed by the 116th Congress, would do precisely that. Its geographic coverage provision identifies those states and political subdivisions with documented continuing patterns of discrimination against voters of color, thereby making clear that preclearance remains needed in those parts of the country. In addition to restoring preclearance, Congress must also now address the Supreme Court's recent decision in Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee, which curtailed the other key provision of the Voting Rights Act, Section 2. The Brnovich decision is divorced from the plain text of Section 2 and flatly inconsistent with Congress's clear and broad purpose in enacting and amending that law. Unless Congress responds by restoring the full intent, the intended intent of Section 2, Brnovich will embolden states and localities to impose new voting restrictions that abridge the right to vote for Black voters and other voters of color. Just as Congress in 1982 overrode the Supreme Court's cramped interpretation of Section 2 in the city of Mobile versus Bolden case, today Congress must override the Brnovich decision to restore the full power of the Voting Rights Act.
1965, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act in response to the heroism of John Lewis, Amelia Boynton Robinson, Fannie Lou Hamer, and so many other Black organizers and activists who risked and who in some cases lost their lives to secure for every American the right to vote and to make real the promise of a multiracial de democracy that had been denied for a century. Their accomplishments were remarkable. But today, those accomplishments and American democracy itself are in grave danger. This Congress must honor the legacy of these extraordinary Americans and safeguard our democracy by establishing a new preclearance framework and restoring Section 2's prohibition on all forms of discrimination that burden, that abridge, that deny the right to vote based on race or color. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Spittle, and I appreciate your remembering and recognizing the civil rights heroes who did so much to bring about the right to vote. Ms. Viola Luizzo, I think, was maybe missing from that. She lost her life uh, during the Montgomery to uh, Selma to Montgomery, uh, Dr. King march. Uh, now we're in the time for five minute rule with questions, and I'll begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. For Ms. Lakin, I would like to ask, what approach would you suggest Congress take to address the court's flawed reading of Section 2 and to further protect voters from discrimination? Thank you for that question. Uh, there are a number of things that Congress could do to rein in Purcell, but any legislative response should ensure that voting rights claims get a full hearing while still leaving room for real cases where injunctive relief shouldn't be issued. And it should also ensure that proximity to an election alone shouldn't be the reason to deny relief. This could look like defining a specific measurable period in which election changes are disfavored for legitimate reasons. This would help to prevent the window during which Purcell is invoked from growing even larger and even more unmoored from its foundations. Congress could also clearly state the public's interest in ensuring freer, free and fair access to the ballot and provide guidance as to how that interest should be weighed against administrative concerns. Congress could also clarify that in deciding whether to stay a court order uh, issued close to an election, that the interests of any voters who have relied on that court order are taken into account and protected. Ms. Lakin, uh, Ms. Lakin let me, I, was, I appreciate your remarks on Purcell, but I was really concerned about Brnovich. Uh, yes, so my apologies. Um, Bernovich ratcheted up the bar for plaintiffs to establish this discriminatory burden. Um, so any response in our view would at, at a minimum do two things. First, it should make clear that any voting practice that interacts with historical and socioeconomic factors uh, to result in discrimination against voters of color run afoul of section two, and that certain considerations are irrelevant to this analysis, such as whether the uh, practice was common in 1982. Second, it should ensure that state defendants provide some evidence that the restrictive practice actually advances some particular and important government interest rather than relying on unsubstantiated fears. There are different ways that Congress can do this. Congress could, for example, adopt an approach that codifies relevant and non-relevant factors as General Clark testified about earlier today. It could also adopt a burden shifting approach modeled on the frameworks uh, for addressing discrimination in Title VII or the Fair Housing Act. This could give guidance to courts as to what evidence a state needs to support an asserted interest and how to weigh that interest against evidence of a discriminatory result. Thank you, Ms. Lakin. Mr. Greenbaum, uh, Section 2 precludes, uh, should Congress just amend Section 2 to preclude courts from considering one of the more Brnovich guideposts when considering voting denial claims? Or if so, in lieu of these guideposts, what factors do you think the court should be required to consider when evaluating vote denial claims under Section 2 and why? So I do think, uh, Chairman Komen, I do think that Congress is going to need to step in and amend Section 2 to address Brnovich. I think what, what you have in front of you, just like in 1982, Congress had uh, a lot of decisions that it could rely on with respect to how to amend Section 2 to create, provide for results claims. You can look at the decisions that have come down in various years and various circuits, like the fourth, the fifth, the sixth circuits that have looked at these claims and have looked at what, what, what factors are relevant. Going back to the fact of having this 
two-part test about there being a disparate burden. Plaintiffs have to prove a disparate burden and they have to show that that burden is caused by the challenge voting practice with and the way that that practice interacts with social and historical conditions of racial discrimination. And in, in all of these cases, uh, the courts, among other things, have looked at the Senate factors from the 1982 report. Thank you, Mr. Green. Uh, Mr. Henderson, Wade, what is your response to those who would argue that the Voting Rights Act, and specifically Section 5's preclearance requirement, is no longer necessary because minority voting registration and turnout are much higher compared to where it was during the Jim Crow era, or higher compared to where it was in 2016 when African Americans didn't realize what President Trump might be like and voted in higher numbers in 2020 to see that there wasn't a President Trump part two. Would you agree with the late Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg's assessment of the court's decision that such an argument was equivalent to throwing your umbrella away in the middle of a rainstorm because you're not getting wet? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that question. And yes, I would associate myself with Justice Ginsburg's comments about the prophylactic uh, role that the Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act has played. First, let me say that as the Census Bureau pointed out with the 2020 analysis, our population has grown. Uh, the fact that we have seen a significant growth in population would also suggest that we would see some growth in voter participation based on an expanded population. That voter participation in and of itself does not suggest, however, that there are not problems. As the reports submitted by the leadership conference in the 10 states with additional states to follow have demonstrated, in each instance, there are recent and current instances of voter discrimination that belie the notion that indeed our country is operating with full equality when it comes to the right to vote. I certainly think the prophylactic theory, uh, uh, role of Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act is key to ensuring that everyone in our country, not just racial minorities, but others as well, enjoy the right to vote as was intended under the Constitution. But this extra uh, additional protection is necessary and has been borne out, Mr. Chairman, by what we have seen at the individual state level and that has been documented by our reports. Thank you, Mr. Henderson, for all of your good work and your opinion today. Next, we will recognize the ranking member, Mr. Johnson, who is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first question for Mr. Von Spakovsky. Thank you again for your expertise and for appearing before our committee uh, once more. Uh, isn't it true that the DOJ's July 28th guidance regarding state efforts to remove the temporary emergency COVID-19 voting procedures is now using those same temporary measures as the new baseline from which to judge compliance with the VRA. Well, that does appear to be what their guideline is doing, which is not a proper uh, interpretation of, of section two. And you will notice that in the prior testimony, it was made very clear, for example, that they had no interest in looking at all the changes that were made by um, state government officials violating state laws. That would normally be something that the Justice Department, particularly the voting section, would look at because when a, when a state official who has no authority uh, in the election area changes or does not abide by a law that the state legislature has passed, I mean, that would be something you should look at to see if there was a potentially discriminatory reason for doing that. And I don't quite understand why that is not something that's being examined. Well, I would venture to guess it looks like selective enforcement or at least selective analysis, but we'll let the, the, the facts speak for themselves. Do, do you think it's credible for anybody to argue that Congress intended for the DOJ to use temporary emergency voting measures adopted during a once in a lifetime pandemic to judge compliance with the VRA? No, I don't, I don't think so. Uh, in particular, because uh, look, the changes were made, the change, many changes that were made all over the country were done, uh, as you say, because of a once in a lifetime emergency measure. Uh, going back to the rules that were in place before that uh, can't be seen, I don't think, as somehow discriminatory. Uh, the, the laws that were in place at that time were not being uh, investigated, were not being sued uh, by the Justice Department. So clearly, at the time, they didn't think there was a problem with, with those rules. And now suddenly, they think there are. That, that doesn't make sense from a, 
uh, common sense point of view or, or from a proper interpretation of section two. Thank you. And just quickly restating the obvious, does the DOJ have the constitutional authority to reinterpret this statute? No, I don't think so. I think they've got to apply a Supreme Court precedent. That certainly is the way uh, it was has always been done at the department. Uh, you, you do what the courts tell you, particularly the Supreme Court, when it comes to how you apply the statute. I, I just have to say also very quickly, uh, I think the Branovich decision correctly interpreted the law. They took the explicit language of Section 2, uh, the Senate factors, which everyone has agreed on um, uh, for years is the proper way to apply it. But in the past, because of the Thornburg versus Jingles decision, those Senate factors were only applied uh, because all the cases that came up were vote dilution cases, really redistricting cases. And what they did in this decision for the first time was say, well, here's, here's how you take these Senate factors and here's how you apply them to a vote denial case. And I don't see anything in the decision that is outside what they have previously done or outside the language of the statute. Thank you so much. Ms. Rorden, uh, thank you also for appearing uh, before us again. Apparently, we have to repeat and reiterate uh, what we've shared before. Let me, let me just ask you to summarize quickly. I'm running out of time, but is the VRA still working today without Sections 4B and 5? You may be muted. Check, check the mute button there. Sorry. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I, I do believe that the uh, permanent tools that are provided already with the permanent provisions of the Voting Rights Act are more than sufficient to target any type of, uh, you know, bad state action or local jurisdiction action. Um, Section 2, um, it, you know, I know I hear a lot of complaints about Section 2 that it's expensive um, and it takes people, you know, like a long time um, to come forward with, um, you know, the case because it is a civil matter. Bottom line is um, many of the times that people have said, oh, well, you didn't get our preliminary injunction, you know, ahead of the election for North Carolina, for example, when that case was moving forward, those particular laws that they were uh, challenging actually went forward. And what it showed was that um, the uh, increase in voter participation by um, non-white voters in North Carolina increased under the laws that they were attacking. So um, it may not be perfect you know, in, in every way, but it certainly provides um, the department as well as private plaintiffs uh, through the 14th and 15th amendment to bring these types of actions if they find that a state of jurisdiction is intentionally um, discriminating against voters. Thank you very much. I'm out of time. I would just say that I don't think there is any perfect legislation. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, I believe next on our list will be Ms. Ross of North Carolina. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks so much to all of the witnesses for testifying. Um, it's very, very helpful. Since the passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, Congress has played a fundamental role in protecting the right to vote. And your testimonies highlighted critical avenues for legislative reform that would provide proactive protections for vulnerable voting populations. Um, Ms. Lakin, I'm going to give you an opportunity to talk about Purcell, um, particularly in North Carolina, where um, the, the date for the primary was moved up. Um, and it's much earlier than it was 10 years ago. And so Purcell will be particularly important um, for any challenge to redistricting. Um, we've heard your testimony that in practice, the federal court's application of Purcell pr principle contributes to rather than reduces confusion among voters and elected officials. Should the proximity of the election be a decisive factor for a court when determining whether to grant equitable relief in Section 2 cases and why or why not? Thank you for that question, for opportunity uh, to weigh in here. The proximity to an election should not be the decisive factor uh, in denying or granting relief in the context of voting rights litigation. Um, at issue is the fact that you might be subjecting voters to a discriminatory um, regime that, um, and, and the fact that um, voters 
who may rely on an order, um, who need this uh, uh, an injunction where there's been a showing of the fact that that election rule might call, might be unconstitutional, very likely is constitutional, that violates the VRA, and and that that rule may be subjecting voters uh, that may be that rule may be in effect to subject voters to uh, a discriminatory regime in voting, and so. Uh, the fact alone that a uh, of election rule is happening close to an election shouldn't be sufficient because you should be taking into account all the different aspects of um, equities, including the public interest in expanding access to free and fair elections. Thank you very much. Um, and I would now like to yield the balance of my time to the esteemed vice chair of the committee, Congresswoman Dean. Well, thank you very much to my colleague and friend, Representative Ross, for yielding to me. And I thank both our chairmen uh, for putting on this very important hearing today. And thank you to the testifiers. Uh, for the record, I'd like to just note that uh, Mr. Jordan misrepresented, actually, the legality of the elections in Pennsylvania. They were found to be free and fair uh, by all courts. Uh, Ms. Lakin, I'd like to follow up with you. Uh, you remember that Professor Nick Stephanopoulos, who appeared before our subcommittee at our hearing held on July 16, 2021, proposed using or importing the disparate impact standard used in other areas of civil rights law for vote denial claims. What are the pros and cons of that approach? Thank you for that question, uh, Representative Dean. There are, uh, there are some uh, virtues of this kind of burden shifting approach. Um, for example, it provides some guidance to courts on how to weigh the different interests against each other, the interests that uh, plaintiffs have uh, in protecting voting rights and the interest that the state has in terms of um, advancing or uh, protecting elections and so forth. Um, but it also provides the, the plaintiffs an opportunity to come back and say, no, there is, that, that there is a better way, there's a less restrictive way in order to protect both interests, voting rights and the state's interests. So that is um, one of the advantages of uh, providing some, some tools for the courts here in a burden shifting framework that is familiar. But at the same time, there is a familiar test that the courts have already used um, in, 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 uh, uh, under Section 2 in protecting voting rights under that framework and codifying factors that are or are not relevant, restoring the Section 2 uh, two-step test that courts are very familiar with um, also has its advantages as well. Thank you so much for that. And my time is running short. Mr. Greenbaum, if I could ask you just quickly, uh, we know that Congress must, must address the burn of its decisions narrowing of Section 2 scope. But even if we do amend it successfully uh, to respond to burn of it, to respond to the decision, would Section 2 litigation alone be enough or adequate substitute for Section 5? No, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be, Congresswoman Dean. Um, retrogression is a completely different issue than what Section 2, uh, what section two covers. I thank you very much. I see my time has expired. Again, thank you to Representative Ross and I yield back. Thank you. Uh, our next question panelist member will be the distinguished Hank Johnson from Georgia. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Henderson, in Shelby County versus Holder, the court invited Congress to draft another <coughs> coverage formula based on, quote, current conditions. Do current conditions, specifically the deluge of state laws making it more difficult to vote since the Shelby County decision, justify the need for a new coverage formula? Thank you, Mr. Johnson, for that question. And the answer is yes. I certainly think uh, the court did open the door to invite Congress to provide an assessment of current conditions that affect the right to vote. Under Section 5 of the uh, 14th Amendment, Congress does have the power to respond to issues regarding discrimination in voting. And the effort to uh, quantify how uh, these changes in state election laws are impacting the right to vote is certainly within the scope of Congress. The Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Um, Ms. Weiser, how does the data your organization and others have provided to the subcommittee 
document that racial discrimination in voting remains a persistent widespread problem? And how does it demonstrate the current need to protect voting rights? Thank you very much for the question, Representative Johnson. We have actually submitted multiple pieces of evidence and studies that demonstrate ongoing race discrimination in voting from discriminatory voter purges that are concentrated in jurisdictions that are likely to be covered by the um, amended Voting Rights Act to discriminatory actions um, uh, across the country in the 2020 election to discriminatory impacts of some of the um, voting restrictions that um, are being introduced across the country and passed um, to date. So there's an thank overwhelming- you. Oh, thank, you. thank you. What geographic coverage formula would you recommend to meet this current need and why would it be constitutional? Well, thank you again for that question. I, I think that the approach that um, this Congress has been taken taking in the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act is an appropriate one and it is well tailored to actually identify those jurisdictions where the problem is most persistent and most widespread and where the remedy of discrimination is most needed. The geographic formula looks, it looks to or, um, over a period of time to jurisdictions that have had multiple violations and it also has provisions in place to make sure that it also covers jurisdictions that are but also currently um, discriminating on the basis of race. Okay, thank you. Mr. McCrary, when striking down the coverage formula in Shelby County, Chief Justice Roberts relied largely on the proposition that minority voter registration and turnout has significantly improved in many parts of the country. Should Congress look at other indicators in addition to registration and turnout to measure the pervasiveness or persistence of race discrimination in the voting process? Mr. McQuarrie must have frozen, but while he's frozen, let me ask Mr. Spittle, how has the public's ability to monitor voting changes been affected now that covered jurisdictions do not have to notify the attorney general of voting changes and has the lack of notice impacted the ability of private plaintiffs to block changes through legislation? Thank you very much for the question, Congressman Johnson. And absolutely, especially at the local level, we see this as a real issue. So without section five, it is very difficult to be even aware of the full range of voting changes potentially discriminatory voting practices that are occurring at the local level, which has been a significant impediment to private civil rights organizations bringing litigation potentially to challenge those practices. Well, let me ask you the question I asked Mr. McCrary. When striking down the coverage formula in Shelby County, Chief Justice Roberts relied largely on the proposition that minority voter registration and turnout has significantly improved in many parts of the country. Should Congress look at other indicators in addition to registration and turnout to measure the pervasiveness or persistence of race discrimination in the voting process? So absolutely, the answer is absolutely yes. I do wanna first note, as Ms. Weiser said earlier, that if you actually look at turnout, the data has been going in the wrong direction since Shelby County. So even on that score, it suggests that the court was declaring victory too soon in terms of improvements in turnout. But there are so many other types of voting discrimination, so many ways in which a voter may have an opportunity to cast a ballot, but if a jurisdiction changes in a way that they change the method of election, if they redistrict, there are so many ways that they can sort of cancel out the impact that that voter can have on the political process. And those are equally unconstitutional and absolutely the types of evidence that Congress should be considering as well. Thank you. Uh, and with that, Mr. Mr. Chair, Johnson, was... Professor McCrary, are you, are you, uh, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah, I think Mr. Johnson asked you a question. You weren't able to respond. Mr. Johnson, would you like to re-ask that question? Yes, I will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. McCrary, when striking down the coverage formula in the Shelby County decision, Chief Justice Roberts relied largely on the proposition that minority voter registration and turnout has significantly improved in many parts of the country. 
Should Congress look at other indicators in addition to registration and turnout to measure the pervasiveness or persistence of race discrimination in the voting process? Yes, Representative Johnson. I, I agree with uh, what Mr. Spittle just uh, testified. And uh, I would point to the uh, geographic coverage formula in HR 4 as the House passed it in 2019 as an improvement over participation rates as a way of identifying uh, the appropriate jurisdictions to cover under preclearance. Thank you. Thank you. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the uh, consideration. You're very welcome. Ms. Garcia, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all the witnesses. There were, everyone had great presentations, and Mr. Chairman, thank you for the selection of such a wide, diverse uh, uh, panel. Uh, I'd like to start my question with um, Mr. Mr. Sines from Melda. You noted accurately that the there's been a population growth among Latinos different than other, other groups in the country. In fact, in Texas, 95% uh, of the population growth that has led to perhaps getting two seats uh, uh, additional to our congressional delegation was 95% people of color, uh, primarily more Latinos. Uh, so in Texas, about half of all the people under 18 are Latino. Uh, and the numbers will change even dramatically more in the next decade. And you've had a long history of defending and litigating the Latino issues in our state. Uh, how does historical evidence demonstrate that the growth in population among a racial minority or language minority group as Latinos uh, catalyzes changes in the voting practices of a particular jurisdiction to limit their voting strength? Thank you, uh, Congressman. I think the history is quite clear, and it was presented uh, last uh, two weeks ago by uh, Professor Bernard Fraga about this notion of a tipping point, that when you do get to a point of growth for a minority voting community, that's often when those in power seek to deter further participation. And unfortunately, as you know, the state of Texas is an example of that. Uh, the very same predominance of minority population growth yielding additional seats occurred a decade ago. But as you know, in response to that, the Texas legislature drew initial lines uh, under which none of the three new seats earned by the state of Texas uh, went to minority voters. It took court intervention under section two to secure, I misspoke, there were four additional seats, to secure two of the four new seats for the growing population of people of color that you described. And indeed, the court in ruling on that section two case concluded that it was not only vote dilution, but it was intentional discrimination on the basis of race against black and Latino voters in the state of Texas. That is an example on a statewide basis of where this tipping point phenomenon has acted in the past to catalyze behaviors that violate voting rights. I simply have to add that even though that three-judge court found intentional discrimination and followed another three-judge court in Washington, D.C. that concluded the same, it still exercised its discretion to deny preclearance coverage, judicially ordered preclearance coverage for the state of Texas. It's another indication in my view why we must step in with congressionally enacted coverage for preclearance. Well, well, thank you. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield now to our former uh, vice chair of our committee, uh, Ms. Rep Ms. Scanlon, uh, for uh, the my remaining two minutes to ask any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Congresswoman Garcia, for yielding your time. And I'd also like to thank my, or extend my thanks to the chairman and members of the subcommittee for allowing me to join you today. Uh, Mr. Spinell, I had a specific question. Uh, the VRA contains express authorization for the Attorney General to seek preventative relief, including preliminary injunctions. Federal courts, including the Supreme Court, have long accepted that the VRA provides an implied private cause of action. Now, recently, in a brief concurring opinion in the Branovich case, Justice Gorsuch expressed doubt about whether such a cause of action exists. Should Congress explicitly provide for a private right of action under the VRA? Thank you very much for the question, Representative Scanlon. I think the answer is yes, 
I should make clear that I think the precedent is overwhelming that there is a private right of action under both Section 2 and other aspects of the VRA. But in an abundance of caution, Congress should absolutely make that explicit. Thank you. Um, Ms. Weiser from the, the Brennan Center, you know, as a representative from PA, which is north of the Mason-Dixon line, but nevertheless, we've seen a whole raft of legislation over the past decade, and particularly since the last redistricting, a series of laws that burden the right to vote, whether through gerrymandering, voter ID laws that would have um, disallowed voting by over half a million eligible voters. Why is it important to a state like Pennsylvania that we um, enact HR4? Well, um, it, the, uh, the bill as Congress is currently contemplating it would both strengthen Section 5 of the Act and Section 2. Section 2 applies nationwide. And so that would ensure that even if Pennsylvania is not covered for preclearance, it would, the voters would still have robust protections against voting discrimination that they could enforce. But that said, the dynamic coverage formula that this Congress is considering actually moves forward. New states that engage in discrimination repeatedly can become subject to preclearance going forward. So that should act as a deterrent to ongoing and repeated discrimination in states like Pennsylvania and other states around the country where there's a new push for discriminatory voting changes. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I yield back to my gracious colleague from Texas, Representative Garcia. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Scanlon, I, if, with, with the, uh, objection. If you have another question, you've been kind enough to be with us and spend several hours. You know, it's an abiding fascination of mine, um, this whole field. Um, I would just ask then if any of the other panelists have anything they wanted to add with respect to the question about whether or not we need to explicitly provide for a private right of action. Congress member, I, I would simply echo what you've heard. Uh, it's clearly established that there is a private right of action, but given the ongoing assault on voting rights that we see, I, I think it would be helpful to make that clear as congressional intent. Uh, there's no question that the Department of Justice, even the most well-resourced Department of Justice, cannot do this alone. Even with preclearance in place, the Department of Justice cannot do it alone. Uh, I have the great pleasure of administering a consortium of 12 nonprofit organizations nationwide engaged in private enforcement of the Voting Rights Act. And I can tell you, based on our monthly conversations, that the work that they do is absolutely essential. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Scanlon. I, you, you and Ms. Dean, you're showing up. It shows your interest in the issue, and, and you're, uh, that's important that people show their respect for the issue, regardless by appearing. And I thank you for doing that, Ms. Dean, as well. Ms. Jackson Lee, you're recognized for five minutes. There are more or less. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you. And I add my appreciation to you as well as Congresswoman Scanlon and Dean and all of my colleagues uh, who have come for this, as I indicate, a very crucial hearing. Mr. Chairman, I wish to set for the record that current conservative Supreme Court that we now have, uh, the current majority has simply never understood or refuses to accept the fundamental importance of the right to vote free of discriminatory hurdles and obstacles. Uh, may I share the view uh, that were it not for the 24th Amendment, I believe this conservative majority on the court would subject poll taxes and literacy tests to the review standard enunciated in Brownville. There lies the importance of following in the words of John Lewis that we must get into good trouble. I wear today uh, his pen uh, that exemplifies and recognizes his spirit in this room today Good trouble means that we are saving the democratic principle voting rights of all Americans. Uh, with that in mind, uh, let me, uh, as I begin, simply acknowledge the brave men and women uh, in Afghanistan, our military, who is doing uh, the work of this nation in saving the lives of all of those who are now impacted. Thank them for their service and those who have served before. I spoke this morning uh, to Representative Ron Reynolds, who is uh, the steadfast remaining uh, members of the Texas delegation that are 
continuingly not going into uh, this den, uh, which is the special session in Texas. I wanna thank them personally on the record uh, for this. And with that in mind, uh, Mr. Henderson, you know the sacrifice that they are making uh, and I know the work that you've done. And so I wanna just go right to the Shelby County opinion. And I have a question for Mr. Sign, so I know my time is waning, uh, that deals with uh, the addressing of the uh, concentration uh, in the jurisdiction singled out for preclearance. Does Roberts asserts that the evil that section five is meant to address may no longer be concentrated in jurisdiction singled out for preclearance. Uh, could you quickly, uh, Mr. Henderson, uh, answer these questions? Has your organization found that there is a concentration of voting rights violations in certain jurisdictions, which justify geographic based coverage? Uh, has a COVID-19 crisis like in Harris County exacerbated ongoing problem of voter discrimination? And does this illustrate the need for Congress to reinstate section five? If you can remember those questions, I'd like to uh, let Mr. Sines know that I have questions for him regarding known practices uh, regarding voting law changes and known practices uh, regarding the historical association of discrimination. So Mr. Sines, your questions will be, what is the constitutional basis for practice-based preclearance and how is uh, practice-based preclearance responsive to the Supreme Court's concern expressed in Shelby? Uh, and finally, uh, as it relates to section two, uh, this question of diminution of, diminution of the vote, uh, doesn't that negatively impact redistricting, which Texas is getting ready to go through and how important after remedies are in, uh, with section two. You know, I fear the redistricting that will be coming up in Texas. Uh, Mr. Uh, Henderson, if you would, I know my time, uh, you'll do a, a very good job quickly so I can get into very brief. Thank, you for, Thank, Thank you, you for your leadership. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your question. In response, the answer is yes to all three. Our reports have documented the increase in voter difficulties in states that have been covered uh, by section five. We've documented that to a great degree for Congress to review. I completely agree with all three of your questions and I'll stop there and uh, turn it over to Mr. Sines. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Mr. Sines. Thank you, Congress member. First of all, known practices coverage or practice-based coverage responds directly to the federalism and equal sovereignty concerns expressed in the Shelby County decision by ensuring that preclearance only applies to practices that have historically and in recent history been used to restrict the rights to vote of minority voters, particularly those who are growing in size and influence, and it responds to equal sovereignty by ensuring that it applies virtually nationwide. There is a demographic trigger that is tied to when it is most likely that these steps will be taken in a vote suppressive me measure, uh, but it otherwise applies not to specific states or specific regions, it applies across the country. With regard to your second question, certainly I share your concern about redistricting. That's why the vote dilution at cause of action under section two is so critical. It has, as you know, uh, preserved the rights of black and Latino voters time after time, decade after decade in the state of Texas and around the country. But I note that practice-based coverage would also ensure that uh, once more, we have the ability to use preclearance to get an initial view about whether the lines being proposed in states like Texas would be acceptable under the Voting Rights Act. So then uh, finally, uh, the importance of fixing section five and section two because of Brownerich, how crucial is that? I'd say it is absolutely crucial. If we fail to do both, then we will leave an opportunity for those who are interested in suppressing minority votes to act in the other regard uh, away from where the Congress has acted. Brnovich is an invitation in much the same way that Shelby County is for Congress to exercise its authority in the 14th and 15th Amendment to respond. It is dealing with vote denial in a way the court hasn't previously, but very much like Mobile versus Bolden, this is an invitation for Congress to act and make clear what its intent is in the vote denial context as it did in 1982 in response to Mobile versus Bolden, resulting in the Thornburg versus Jingles decision, as you know, Congressman. Thank you. Thank I want to so thank, thank all of our members who attended today and particularly our witnesses who were spectacular. Uh, this concludes today's hearing. I want to thank all of our witnesses did somebody have a request yes, yes i have a um Ms. Unanimous consent. thank you mr yes. chairman i'm so sorry unanimous consent to put into the record a texas monthly article greg abbott's voter suppression methods have become more subtle but they are they're still uh, transparent as unanimous consent uh then from nbc news racist voter suppression texas laws keep latinos from ballot box 
as evidenced by this article and groups uh, that are helping to empower all voters to vote. Ask unanimous consent that these articles be placed into the record. Without objection, so done. Thank you, Ms. Jackson Lee. Um, like once again, the, the, now we have concluded our hearing and I thank all of our witnesses for appearing today. All have uh, get, been important in the process that we have to uh, undergo to get a voting rights law to, to, to a vote. Uh, without objection, all members have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. Uh, with that, once again, we're experiencing great trauma uh, our nation and our world in Afghanistan and keep all of the soldiers uh, in your thoughts and prayers and all of the Afghanis who helped us in your thoughts and prayers. With that, uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.